now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 16th, 2022 Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors meeting. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair of the board, and I call this meeting to order. Um, first, we'll have a roll call, an introduction of new members and alternates this evening. And <clears throat> I was having a little bit of trouble at the start of the meeting finding our new member list. So I will ask Melinda Stevens if she could introduce the new board members. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, unfortunately, you'll have to give me a second as well, but I think sorry about that. <laughs> pretty quick. No, no, no. You are absolutely fine. Let me pull that up really fast. Okay, it's coming up now. <clears throat> All right. Um, so for our new members, uh, our new members are Chuck Harmon from the City of Idaho Springs. Um, she was introduced last meeting, but I would like to introduce her again. Uh, we have Lisa Smith, who is the new member for the City of Arvada. Um, and then we have Jeslyn Shahrezai of the city of Lakewood. Hopefully I got that right, Jeslyn. Uh, and then we have a new alternate uh, for the city of Lakewood, which is Rich Olver. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much, Melinda. And with that, we will do a roll call of members. Um, for folks that are just tuning in, don't worry, we'll get everybody sorted out and pulled over to the right area. Um, it'll just take a moment and if we have any people that we miss in the roll call, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get it all sorted at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Melinda Stevens for a roll call. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Allison Coons of Aurora. Mike Kaufman of Aurora. Oh, sorry, I'm here. This is Allison. Oh, nope, that's okay. Thank you so much, Allison. <clears throat> Ari Harrison of Erie. Sarah Laughlin of Erie, Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs, Claire Levy of Boulder County, present. Colleen Whitlow of Mead, present. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Hurst of Commerce City, present. David Spellman of Blackhawk, Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines, present. Don Cognac of Firestone, David Whelan of Firestone, George Lance of Greenwood Village, Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village, George Teal of Douglas County, Abe Layden of Douglas County, Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuie. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Jan Plowski of Brighton, Adam Cushing of Brighton. I'm here. Thank you. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Jeslyn Shahrezai of Lakewood. Here and well done, Melinda. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Jim Torini of Decono. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Joan Peck of Longmont. Present. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Yeah. Christopher Larson of Netherland. Larry Vidum of Bennett. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. I'm here. Lisa Smith of Arvada. Hello, hello, present. Thank you. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margo Ramson of Bomar. I'm here. Thank you, Neil Shaw of Superior. 
Tim Howard of Superior, Nicholas Angelo of Lions, Holly Rogan of Lions, Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Steve Ward of Inglewood. Paul Hazeman of Goldman. Here. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Sean Ferre of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Tushare of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart of Cherry Hills Village. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. I'm here. Awesome. Sarah Numella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Brian Wong of Lafayette. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Kyle Schlachter of Littleton. Steve O'Doricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. I'm here, good evening. Thank you. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Andy Kerr of Jefferson County. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. I'm here. Winshaw of Lone Tree. Sure. All right. Uh, with that, we do have a quorum, Madam Chair, and I will hand it back to you for anyone that we did miss. Thank you very much. And so um, if you'll just raise your hand if we missed you and we'll get to taking care of Jamie <coughs> Jeffrey, Stephanie Walton, uh, Bud Starker, Josie Cockrell, and Rebecca White are all here. George Teal and Bill Van Meter is also here. And Lynn Baca is here with us. And Sally Chafee from CDOT. Thank you all very much. And if we missed anybody else, we will get it all sorted out. Um, Rachel Bink Binkley is also here. And Lisa Smith. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. If we missed anybody else, we will sort it out um, with the chat and the panelist uh, after the meeting. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, that takes us to approval of our agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? <clears throat> um, Director Starker. Uh, I move to approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Yeah. Second, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Sand Sandgren seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The agenda is approved. And so that takes us. Boy, I'm just having a hard time keeping my, I'll put it over here and I won't lose it now. That takes us um, to the report of the chair. And so I will turn it over to a report from Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, we met earlier this month, uh, that would be February 2nd, and we had a couple of items on the agenda. We took action on uh, award nominations for a variety of, of awards coming up for the annual awards program. We also talked about that, talked about just some of the issues around uh, the planning for the event, which we hope everyone attends. We also talked about the 2022 board retreat, uh, which we'll be getting more information on, we talked about options, locations, and topics, uh, those type of things. Uh, I do wanna just briefly mention, I have served on performance and engagement for a number of years. And this past year, it was a, a great honor chairing the committee. I wanna thank all the committee members for uh, making it just a, a great year as chair of performance, performance and engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Conklin. Um, next, we'll have a report from the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. This evening, Finance and Budget Committee authorized the Executive Director to negotiate and execute a contract with Bright Systems for approximately $360,000 with a one-year term 
that supports uh, for data work that supports the AAA. We authorize the executive director to amend an existing contract for $70,000 with Milliman Actuarial Services to a total not to exceed $81,000 uh, to conduct additional analysis on data from the Accountable Health Communities model. And uh, I wanted to thank both the committee and Dr. Cog's staff for their fine work on the Finance and Budget Committee this year. It's been my pleasure to serve. And Madam Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And that takes us to the report from the Executive Director. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, I just, uh, I'll, I'm just going to note a couple items that uh, Director Conklin mentioned that we, we've been having discussions with with the Performance and Engagement Committee. The first is the board retreat. Um, I mentioned this last month, and we do have a date now, which is September, April second. Um, did I say September? <laughs> yes, you said September and April. It was pretty fun. <laughs> I meant to say Saturday, April second. And uh, so we've been working with the Performance and Engagement Committee and we're finalizing, and we will be finalizing the agenda at the March uh, 2nd PE meeting. Uh, and but we're really hoping that to use this as an opportunity for our board members to re-engage. It's been a long time, been a long two years for sure. Uh, we are anticipating that this will be an in-person event. And uh, I think the, the whole theme of the event will be re-engagement. So uh, we're excited about it. I will tell you that because of the uncertainty of, of COVID, we are planning on uh, hosting the event at the Dr. Cog offices. So please save the date. We will be sending out some information, uh, save the date notice by, uh, by the end of this week, hopefully. Um, on the award celebration, again, just a quick reminder uh, that as Director Conklin mentioned, the event uh, please mark your calendars for the evening of April 27th. Um, and we'll be hosting that in-person event at Empower Field at Mile High. And this is, of course, a great opportunity for, for all of us to celebrate the, the projects, plants, and people in our region that are helping us meet our Metro Vision objectives. Um, and we'd love for everybody to enjoy us. Actually, we hope and encourage and expect everybody to be at that event. Um, board directors are invited to attend the event at no charge, and registration will be open soon. We're just working out some final details with our, with our software to, so we can open that up. Um, would also like to ask and encourage um, our, our member local governments to purchase um, uh, tables, sponsoring the event by purchasing a, a table, which is $900 uh, and it seats uh, 10. So we would strongly encourage you. And again, if you have any leads on sponsorships, please send them my way or Steve Erickson's way. We'll be happy to, to track those down. Um, you know, this, these events are not cheap and we want to make sure to try to try to utilize all the sponsorship opportunities that we can. So if you have any further questions, please, of course, always reach out to myself or Steve Erickson. Um, a little update on the, on the regional transportation plan and, and sorry, and the, and the upcoming TIP calls. And I know the sub-regional forums are gearing up um, for the upcoming TIP calls. And, and as you are, I'd just like to uh, remind you all that the board recently adopted a valuable regional complete streets toolkit. Um, staff also developed a doc Dr. Cog's first ever GIS story map to accompany that. But more, more specifically, what, what we'd like you know, to you, for you to consider is to utilize that toolkit to assist you all in developing multimodal projects for, for the TIP that um, obviously help implement the uh, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan uh, projects and priorities. So it's easy to find. Um, you can just get on the, the uh, Dr. Cog homepage and just scroll down to news and announcements. And there's a little blurb there that talks about the toolkit and the story map. And just click on that and it'll take you to the appropriate links. Um, Winter Bike to Work Day, uh, which was organized and hosted by Dr. Cog Way to Go team last Friday. Um, and, and those that uh, got on the call a little early were able to see some of the photos that were taken um, by staff uh, associated with that event. Um, it's, you know, it's obviously, it's not as large as our summer event, right? But this is, uh, this is really, you know, we were, we were impressed. We got seven, 1,700 pledges and 48 breakfast stations were established throughout the region. Um, so I really want to thank everybody that, that were involved for the success of that event. And we'll be back hosting our summer Bike to Work Day event in June. 
Um, that's after two years of pivots due to the pandemic. So we're excited to get back and, and really promote that event for, for truly what it is, which is a great opportunity to, to experience biking um, in a safe and, uh, and welcoming environment. Last but not least, Madam Chair, I would like, do we have a birthday boy in the house tonight? Ron Papsdorf. It's a birthday on February 16th, 29 years old and holding is what I've been told. So congrats. I'm meeting that milestone, Ron. That's my report, Madam Chair. Happy birthday to Ron. And we should all clap. That's wonderful. What a great way to spend your birthday. <laughs> um, Thank you, Executive Director Rex. And so that takes us to our public comment period tonight. Um, up to 45 minutes is now allocated for public comment. Each speaker will have three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. I would request that there are no public comment for issues which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Thank you. Any members of the public care to comment? Go ahead and raise your hand. Good evening, Randall. You're first up. Randall Loeb. Sorry about that. I guess I need to unmute you here. Huh. There we go. Can you unmute on your end, Randall? I did it. There we go. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to address um, the regional leadership of this uh, area. I I'm uh, basically two blocks away from the main office and have been for over a year um, since I stepped down from a position running um, a community um, uh, neighborhood organization, uh, being the caretaker of it. I'm now involved with Bayot Enterprises, and uh, I've been doing that for as long as the pandemic has been going on. Um, I live on Social Security, and I'm in a uh, what's in the, called the non-congregate shelter called Aloft at the moment. And uh, it concerns me as one ages, as it was recorded in a newspaper article and, and on the news, um, what we do with our elder um, members of our community. I, I just passed 71. Uh, maybe it's not that old to some folks, but it certainly feels differently for me. And I ride a bicycle every day. And even in terrible weather, I rode my bicycle to work today. Um, and I really am concerned that there are more and more people without the means to actually take care of themselves. And I've been quoted to on this event. And I know that for the Denver Regional Council of Governments and COGS in general, um, this is one of your primary um, uh, areas of interest. Um, the safety and the po possibilities of older people living in safety um, for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, I live as simply as possible, but my goal would be to help other people uh, to understand the problems that is, are associated with the person who's single, who does not have the resources in order to um, be in a place and is actually um, in a sort of a no person's land between being able to be self-sufficient and having the sense that perhaps you're going to lose everything at one point and have to be in a nursing home or hospice or whatever. And I hope that you can understand my concern because I'm sure many of you have the same issues or know someone who does. Uh, I've spoken to several groups um, throughout the area regarding um, some of these matters. And I just want to always make it present and, and point out that we all matter and how our community lives is a significant issue. Thank you for your time. I see my time has elapsed and you take care. Thank you, Randall. Next, we have Danny Katz. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Danny Katz. I'm the executive director of COPER, the Colorado Public Interest Research Group. If you're unfamiliar with us, we're a statewide advocacy group. We speak up for a healthier and safer Colorado, where everyone's freer to pursue their own individual well-being as well as the public good. I'm here today to offer a general comment that 
Um, we are calling on Dr. Cog and really all local governments, RTD, CDOT, and, and anyone and anyone to go big on transit in the next two years. Uh, we have a very important window to be able to tackle uh, the climate change pollution that's coming from our transportation system, as well as the Vision Zero goals and the ozone pollution goals. And the window is, is an unprecedented opportunity because of the funding that we have coming down from the federal government, local, state. And so going big on transport, transit really means looking at two things in my mind. One is the recent CDOT greenhouse gas rule that came out did a scenario plan of how we would hit the goals. And, and one of the numbers that stuck out to me was we need to increase transit uh, uh, ridership by 70% uh, in the next decade. Um, at the same time, I sit on the RTD Reimagine Committee and we were briefed on the system optimization plan that they've been developing. And it looks like for the next four to six years, we could be somewhere around 85% of what ridership was pre-pandemic levels. And so we have to figure out a way to close that gap. Like I said, whether it's for climate, for our Vision Zero goals, for our air pollution goals, over the next month or two, Copert will be making this our top priority, um, thinking through how can we uh, identify new projects, new, um, new strategies to bring forward, to raise up, and uh, recognizing that this is not something that Dr. Cog can do alone. This is not something that RTD can do alone. This is not something that local governments can do alone. But we're all going to need to work together and truly prioritize transit in a way that I don't think we've done in, in quite some time. Uh, capital will be important. I mean, being able to build um, uh, you know, dedicated bus lanes will be helpful. But it really, I think, in my mind, comes down to operating in service. And there's a huge gap there. We've got to figure out how to fill it. We've got to be as creative and strategic as we possibly can. And uh, we'll be working over the next couple of months and we'll likely come back with some some um, uh, suggestions and recommendations, but hoping everybody can really see the next uh, the next year or two as as just a, really our window to go big uh, on transit in our region in order to tackle some of our biggest problems and, and hit those those big goals. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and, and uh, look forward to working with anyone uh, here on the call. Thank you, Danny. Next, we have Matt Frommer. All right, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Good evening, members of the Dr. Cog board and happy birthday, Ron Papsdorf. My name is Matt Fromer, I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. I'm here tonight to urge the Dr. Cog board to support House Bill 221138, which would create new programs and tax credits for employers that offer a wider variety of transportation options to their employees. The new programs will give Coloradans better access to clean and affordable mob mobility options and help to reduce congestion, improve air quality and address climate change. Colorado is facing serious challenges on climate and air quality. The Denver metro area has the eighth highest ozone pollution in the US and the second highest outside California. Passenger vehicles are the largest source. Transportation is also the largest source of greenhouse gas pollution. Solving these challenges will require a combination of vehicle electrification and mode shifting toward cleaner and more efficient travel options like transit, biking, walking, and telework. This bill is not about taking away anyone's car keys, but about giving people access to safe, reliable, and affordable transportation options. House Bill 1138 represents a compromise with the business community. It requires the lowest hanging fruit, simple and low cost strategies like employee surveys, commuting information like transit maps, bicycle maps, and the activation of the federal pre-tax commuter benefit for transit and van pool passes. Most of these materials and templates are readily available through Dr. Cog's Way to Go platform. The second part of the bill provides financial incentives for businesses that voluntarily choose to offer alternative mobility options to their employees including things like flex work schedules, transit passes, electric vehicle charging, bicycle facilities, and parking cash outs. Lastly, the bill would increase funding for our TMAs and TMOs to expand their employer TDM programs. 
The bill aligns with many of Dr. Cog's Metro Vision performance measures, including goals to reduce the percentage of commuters who drive alone to work, lower daily vehicle miles traveled, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and improve job uh, to transit accessibility, particularly for low-income residents. The program will also help Dr. Cog comply with CDOT's new greenhouse gas planning rule. These programs have been in place for decades in other cities and states. For example, Washington State adopted a similar policy in 1991, and the program has reduced commuter vehicle miles traveled by 6% for employers in the program. In Seattle, the program contributed to a 20% reduction in single occupancy vehicle commute trips. As we emerge from the pandemic, we have a rare opportunity to shape travel habits and behavior. And this is the perfect time to roll out a comprehensive and meaningful commute program in partnership with the largest employers in our state. And so I urge the Dr. Cog board to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jenny Gnay. Jenny, you might be muted. Hi. There we go. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jenny Gang, and I'm the transportation manager for Conservation Colorado. Uh, I am also here to urge you to support House Bill 221138, Reduce Employee Single Occupancy Vehicle Trips, um, which Matt did an excellent job of describing. Um, this bill creates a strong and effective program for employee trip reduction that prioritizes equity for essential and low-income workers. I don't have to tell you about pollution on the front range. You've all seen the devastating impacts, record ozone alert days when it was unsafe to go outside, the high incidences of asthma and other respiratory diseases, especially in low income neighborhoods and communities of color located near highways, and the tragic Marshall Fire that ended 2021 with a reminder of how important it is that we act now and with every tool in our toolbox. Reducing single occupancy vehicle trips is one of the most important and complicated ways to combat pollution from transportation. House Bill 1138 provides tax incentives for employers that provide their employees a range of effective options for how to get to work. And importantly, it makes sure that those benefits are offered to all essential workers and employees making under $40,000 a year. Um, and it sets the stage for all large employers and their employees to explore commuting in a new way by requiring annual commuter surveys, pre-tax commuter benefits, and parking, parking cash out options. Passing this bill is an essential step towards rectifying our air quality, reaching our state climate goals, and building a thriving transportation system that works for the Denver metro region and beyond. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide comment, and I hope you will all vote to support House Bill 1138. Thank you. Next, we have Audrey DeBarros. Thank you, Chair Stoltzman and members of the Board of Directors. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment tonight to voice our support for House Bill 1138. Um, I am the Executive Director of Commuting Solutions and we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and one of the eight uh, transportation management organizations in the Denver region, representing the Northwest Metro region in Boulder and Broomfield counties. And we are a very proud partner in the Dr. Cog Way to Go program, along with our other sister TMOs, working together to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. And um, again, I'm here to support um, House Bill 1138 and to ask for your support this evening. Um, Matt Frommer just did a wonderful job of summarizing, you know, the context in, in which this bill is very important to achieve climate change, multimodal traffic congestion and air quality goals, all of which align with the Dr. Cog Metro Vision plan. But speaking as a TDM practitioner, a transportation demand management practitioner who has worked in the field for over 20 years, we are really not able to keep pace in the Denver region to shift mode share. Um, through voluntary involvement for business from businesses. We have been doing that for decades and we still have, have the issues that we have at hand. Due to the spread out nature of our land use uh, in many parts of the region and limited multimodal systems in place, our ability to demonstrate success and inspire that commute behavior change is oftentimes limited to those employers who are located in more urban environments who are more sustainably oriented or where the employer might have limited parking supply. 
And we really fear that unless the Denver, Denver region leads out um, with a bill such as this to mandate participation in services that we are offering, we will not achieve the, the climate change goals that our governor has set forth for the Denver region and the state of Colorado. So we really want to see TDM as a more meaningful strategy. Um, and the Way to Go partnership stands ready to help businesses and make it a turnkey, easy program for them to implement. And I think that Steve Erickson from Dr. Cog's staff will tell you all about how we have readied ourselves um, through the My Way to Go platform. So we respectfully ask for your approval this evening. Um, thank you for your time and consideration. And I also thank you, thank you for your service on the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. And I too would like to wish Ron Papsdorf a very, very happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. And that takes us to our public comment period tonight. Um, so that takes us to our consent agenda. Could I please get a motion from a member to approve the consent agenda? We have um, Director Shaw. Uh, move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Starker? I'll second that. Thank you. Any discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you everyone, the motion carries. And that takes us to our first action item this evening, which is election of officers. You'll find it as attachment F in the packet. And I'm, I'm going to turn it over to um, Executive Director Rex to turn it over to the nominating committee. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the nominating committee for, for their work. They've, they've had to meet a, a few times lately, as you'll see on your agenda today. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the, the chair of the nominating committee, uh, Director John Dyer. Uh, thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Um, I also would like to uh, thank uh, the nominating committee specifically, uh, Director Daigle, Director Mullica, Director Peck, Director Sanger, and Director Williams for their, for their time, uh, their service, and their flexibility. Um, we've, we've uh, as Executive Director Rex indicated, we have... Uh, uh, we've met uh, a number of times and uh, to, to go through the next three items. Uh, so let's get to it. Um, uh, the first item is the nominating committee recommendations election for the board officers. Um, we wish to thank everybody who applied. Um, it, was, it was a very tough decision. Uh, we, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, receiving everybody's, uh, everybody's application or request for consideration. Uh, we, uh, we reviewed it and uh, very tough decisions. Uh, uh, our recommendation would be to promote uh, Director Conklin to Vice Chair, uh, promote uh, Director Shaw to Secretary, and um, uh, to also nominate uh, Director Baker for the, the vacant position of Treasurer. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I will uh, be available for any questions if the board uh, deems it appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I just take a moment on this one um, and we'll see if we have any questions from board members. Um, and I'll just pause here for a minute because you know, in normal times we would all be together. So we would all know each other better and see faces and could see um, and congratulate each other, maybe step out and get a cup of coffee and a cookie in the lobby together. So I just wanna pause long enough to make sure if people have questions about looking through their screen, who are these people? Have I met them before? <laughs> or want to check in your packet under attachment F um, to just be following along on what we're looking at. Any questions from members? All right, not seeing any, if you want to tell us the next report, um, Director Dyack. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the next item uh, would be to appoint members of the Finance and Budget and Performance Engagement Committees. Um, this is this is something that uh, uh, we uh, collectively encourage everyone to participate uh, into uh, either finance and budget or performance engagement. Um, it is it is very fundamental to the operations of Dr. Cock. Um, with with all of the applications, uh, we considered all and we were able to accommodate all of the applications uh, for both finance and budget and performance and engagement. And uh, again, I will be available for any questions if the board deems it appropriate. 
Thank you very much, Director Dyke. Any questions from board members on that slate from the nominating committee? Seeing none, if you'll give us your final report. Thank you, Director Dyke. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the, the next and the last one is Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, this is a rather new, um, uh, new item. It is a new item uh, for the nominating committee to consider. Um, very, uh, very regionally uh, significant and uh, significant interest. And uh, we wish we had more than just four seats so we could um, uh, place additional Dr. Cog members on this. Uh, the, the, the board, I'm sorry, the nominating committee um, had some significant uh, discussions and, and some challenges as to how we approach this. But in the end, our recommendation is to, um, is to um, recommend the following candidates, uh, Director Mullica, uh, Director Peck, Director Mulvey, and uh, former Director Chris Nevitt, uh, now a uh, City and County of Denver uh, Transit-Oriented Development Manager. Uh, additionally, the, uh, the nominating committee felt strongly that we should provide um, a letter of support for Boulder County Commissioner Claire Levy to be an appointee, um, uh, a governor appointee, um, again, if, if, if desired. So with that, I would, I would like to turn it back to you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you again to everybody. Um, I, I had great, great conversations with those who were selected. And I had um, some very enjoyable conversations and some very tough conversations with those who weren't. So again, thank you all. And um, I appreciate your interest and um, keep on applying. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Were there any questions from folks on the Range Passenger Rail board? CA, um, thank you, Director Levy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I did want to just, uh, address the, the note here. I appreciate that um, that the nominating committee um, recommends that the Dr. Cog board um, provide a letter of support for me. Um, however, uh, I um, am not at all certain that I actually will apply for that position. Uh, the reason being that um, that the Northwest MCC got together and agreed to support uh, Devin Schaap from City and County of Broomfield for that position. And, and I, uh, I wouldn't want to um, be in conflict with the position of the Northwest MCC. So I do appreciate that vote of support. However, um, I uh, have not decided whether I actually will seek a, a governor's appointment. Thank you, Director Levy. Any other questions or comments? All right, so let's go back up um, if we can. Thank you very much, whoever's controlling the screen right now. And so there's a motion proposed. Um, so the first motion that's proposed is on the election of board officers for 2022. Is there a member who'd like to make a motion? Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move to elect board officers for 2022. Is there a second, Director Peck? I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And I will just pause for a moment and ask Director Flynn if he'd like to make comments as the incoming chair. Congratulations, Chairman <laughs> Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair Stolzman. Just a, a few things. Just uh, let me take a minute here uh, to say uh, a few things mm -hmm. that have been on my mind lately. And one of them is that I seem to recall it was back in the early 80s when I was a journalist at the Rocky Mountain News and I was covering uh, civic issues and uh, issues of governance that I attended my first Dr. Cog board meeting at the, the old Diamond Hill office. And if I could have fast forwarded almost 40 years and see myself here, I never would have believed it. Mm -hmm. I was always on the other side reporting on this, but I'll tell you one thing that my journalism career taught me, and that is the power of collaboration and of listening to every side and listening intently and honestly and authentically in, a, in the spirit of collaboration and trying to reach the best possible outcomes for everyone in this region, which is such a diverse region. The second thing I wanted to say is I wanted to congratulate uh, my colleagues, particularly uh, the new uh, board member, uh, Jeff Baker. I've gotten to know here on the board, uh, welcome him to the team, look forward to working together. 
And also wanted to congratulate uh, Director Wynne Shaw and Steve Conklin uh, on their uh, elevation to up the ladder. And uh, lastly, uh, Chair Stolzman, I wanna thank you for your very intentional and deliberate and uh, very well-run leadership this year. Uh, this has been a very difficult year being in the second year of COVID and being in remote uh, meetings, but more particularly the last two months for you in particular, and for all of our sister uh, communities up in Boulder County, Superior, Louisville, and the areas of Boulder County that were so devastated. Uh, I, uh, I, I still marvel at the, uh, the task that uh, faces you all going forward. I want you to, you to know that my heart continues to go out to you. And I'm sure uh, I can speak for, I, I hope I can speak for everyone here that all of our hearts go out to you. But not only that, more importantly, our resources, our time and our effort also are at your disposal to the extent that we can lend assistance, staff-wise, resource-wise, please, please call on us. There, but for the grace of God and the winds and where the fire started that day, any, uh, any one of us could be here. So I pledge that I will continue to work with you and your sister and the sister communities up there, Superior, Louisville, Boulder County, uh, in any way that we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Flynn. And um, I'll just let folks know, um, Director Flynn will take over chairing at the very next meeting. Um, so you'll have to put up with me for the rest of today. And I'll just take, take a moment to make a few comments. Um, so I just, I, I wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to serve the region as the chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, just like Ron is spending his 29th birthday with us here tonight, uh, many of us probably recall nights that we spent, um, that we were down in Denver or on the computer in the other room when our families were in the other room. Um, and it, it really is a valuable use of our time to come together in this way. Um, while Ron was Ron is here tonight on his birthday, I spent my 10th wedding anniversary with all of you, but don't worry, I'm still married. It's okay. Um, and I just, uh, the reason it's important is that we do really important work together. And the way we're able to get all that important work done is because Dr. Cog's staff really are the top-notch staff in the region. They're incredibly professional. Um, when other people see the work that they're doing, um, they ask how it all gets done with such a small team. These are the best of the best. If you haven't met everybody on Dr. Cog's staff, do take the time to. If you have a problem in your town and you need help, reach out to Dr. Cog's staff because they probably have a good idea on how to connect you with resources. And just a quick shout out to Connie Garcia, um, who really helped me tremendously when I started on Dr. Cog and I miss her very much. So I just wanna say that. Um, I'm really sorry to everyone for having to have the virtual meetings the last year. And I'm excited for getting back in person. One of the things that's really, really great about Dr. Cog is the relationship that you build and being able to count on them. So when I hear Director Flynn say he's there for me, I really know that that's true. And I have felt that support. Um, when I first got on, I was uh, very nervous and I, I kind of looked to who people were talking to and comfortable with. And I started sitting next to Ron Rutowski and copying off his notes, basically. Um, but in the Zoom environment, we don't have a chance to do that. So please go to the board retreat. Please talk to each other. And let me tell you about some of the kinds of things you'll learn. I learned from Rachel Binkley how much I miss Celebrity Sports Center when she did her awesome community presentation. Um, Sally Daigle was kind enough to give me some of her very own eggs. If you haven't had any of Sally's eggs, you're missing out. They're way better than anything you get at the store. I now know what a police judge is because of Lynette. Um, <laughs> When I was at the award ceremony a few years ago, I was lucky enough to meet um, some of John Dyack's colleagues, and they were nice enough to send me screenshots of the nice things John's mom says on Facebook about him, which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I learned how Commissioner Teal met his wife at the board retreat. I learned what POF stands for in radio from Steve. Uh, we have members who own rest restaurants, who help au pairs, who are lawyers, nurses, veterans. There's a, even one member on the board of directors who's never tasted coffee and another who's allergic to pumpkin. So I just would encourage <laughs> you all to get to know each other to that level and, and we can work 
getting back in person. And what we can do when we know each other that well is we can really focus on the things that bring us together because there's so much more that brings us together than divides us with our differences. And by doing that, we can continue to work on things like our Metro vision and commit to addressing the most pressing challenges in the region. We can continue to do things like reorganize our tip process so that people don't have to worry about horse trading and that people know they're getting a fair share and good projects are getting funded. And we can continue to increase our services that we're offering for senior citizens and helping people um, just have better lives throughout the region. So I just really encourage everybody to continue working together like you have been. And I just wanna thank you for the opportunity that I've had to be the chair. Um, Executive Director Rex. Wow, thank you very much. Very nice comments. I, uh, I listen. This is always a bittersweet moment for me. I've, I've been very lucky through my years here at Dr. Cog to be, be had the opportunity to work with some tremendous board chairs and and no one better than you, Ashley. I mean, I swear you, you're 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 fabulous. So responsive. I think we've developed quite a, a, a a very good relationship over the last year. We work very intimately over a lot of different topics, and it's been a difficult time, of course, during COVID and and the uh, obviously the events that you're experiencing up in up in Boulder County right now. But um, but I just truly, from my, for, on behalf of staff, I wanted to thank you so very very much for for all your work and effort, what you have done, and what you will continue to do in uh, in collaborative spirit um, for this region. I mean, you listen, facilitating multiple viewpoints that's a real skill. And uh, that's why I think Dr. Cog is such a special place. I mean, you know, I had done a lot of orientations recently with a lot of new board members. And, and uh, there's a reason we've been around since 1955, the third oldest council of governments in the country, right? Because we just have that collaborative spirit, whatever it is, it seems to work here. And, uh, and it's, it's in large part because of people like yourself. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Executive Director X, Chairman Flynn. Uh, thank you, uh, Ashley. Uh, just as a point of personal privilege, uh, many of you at the past couple of awards dinners that were in person uh, met my wife, Harriet. She wanted to give me a congratulatory kiss on my election, if that's, if that's <laughs> permissible. That is perfectly permissible. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Chair. That's fantastic. We, we've been looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so that takes us to our next um, slate from the nominating committee. Um, which is the slate of members for the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance Committee. If there is a member who could make a motion, um, Director Dakel. Me? Yes, I will make a motion. Thank you very much. So uh, Director Dale moves to appoint the members of the Finance and Budget Committee and Performance Engagement Committee as proposed. Is there a second? Director Starker. I second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion of the slate? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And that takes us to our next recommendation from the nominating committee, which is the slate of candidates to serve on the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Is there a motion from the floor? Director Teal? Madam Chair, if it pleases the board, I'd like to make a motion to approve the Dr. Cog Nominating Committee's recommended candidates to represent Dr. Cog on the Front Range Rail Pass Passenger Rail District Board. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Lindstedt, do you want to second that? Yep, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion from members? Um, Director Kelsey. Um, I just want to point out that I will not be casting a vote because um, Georgetown is in Clear Creek County and therefore excluded from the MPO area. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Director Kelsey, for your attention to detail. And so I'll ask for abstentions on this one. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And we'll recognize Director Kelsey on that. Um, for not voting on that one. Thank you all very much. And that takes us through that agenda topic. And that brings us to the next um, matter this evening, which is the discussion of amending FY 2022 to FY 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. Um, I'll turn it over to Josh Schwenk, our Assistant Planner in Transportation and Planning and Operations. Good evening, Josh. 
Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm hoping you're seeing uh, the board memo on your screen now. We are. All right, perfect. Um, so just as a refresher for those of you that um, have been on the board or as a um, introduction for those of you that might be new, our Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP is a document that covers uh, the transportation planning activities conducted in our region over a two year period. This is the required product which Dr. Cog develops um, in our role as the federally designated Metropolitan Planning Organization or MPO for the Denver region. Um, and therefore it's con so our current UPWP covers federal fiscal years 2022 and 23 and was adopted by our board of directors in July last year. Recently, several changes have been made at both the state and federal levels. Um, and so we're proposing amending our UPWP to bring it into alignment with the new uh, regulatory landscape. So first, um, at the state level, uh, we have uh, SB 260, as well as our new greenhouse gas rule. So uh, we've ensured that tasks in the UPWP cover the required GHG modeling work, as well as added some opportunities to prioritize carbon, uh, reducing carbon emissions. Next, at the federal level, uh, the big change would be our new uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA. Uh, you'll sometimes hear the administration call this the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, B-I-L. Uh, this was signed into law last November, uh, replacing the FAST Act. So um, it includes several provisions. Among these are a set of transportation planning factors. These are topics that have to be considered by MPOs as part of our planning process. Mostly the IIJA carried these directly forward from the FAST Act, but they did add the word housing into planning factor five. So MPOs must now consider strategies that promote consistency between transportation improvements and housing. So as is the case with uh, most of the provisions in this new law, we're still waiting on some additional federal guidance on what specifically is required. But in the meantime, we have added a task to the UPWP to consult with housing agencies in order uh, to incorporate housing into our transportation planning process, just so that we can begin those discussions and start to shape what this might look like here in our region. Um, some other major tasks added uh, related to the IIJA include working with the state to develop a carbon reduction strategy, identifying and prioritizing potential projects for some of the new federal grant opportunities, and reviewing and potentially updating the critical urban freight corridors in our region. Um, also, in December of last year, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a set of eight new planning emphasis areas. Uh, these align MPO activities with national goals and priorities. Uh, so staff is actually already engaged in a lot of activities around these emphasis areas, so not a lot of changes were needed, but we have added some additional coordination tasks in order to meet the intent of emphasis area five, uh, strategic highway network and U.S. Department of Defense coordination, and uh, planning emphasis area six, federal land management agency coordination. Um, finally, we've also updated the financial tables at the end of the document just to reflect the new revenues anticipated to be available through the IIJA that can then cover these additional work tasks that are being added to the document. So with that, happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion for your consideration. Thank you very much. Any questions from members or discussion? Uh, Director Levy. Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chair. and, and um, Thank you for the presentation. If, if you attended the uh, Regional Transportation Commission, you'll be prepared for my question, which is, um, I think it's great that uh, we have explicit direction to incorporate housing uh, into this metropolitan planning process, but um, I, I really feel that we're gonna have to do some work to flesh this out and understand exactly what that means. and what we're trying to achieve and does that bring a, a dimension to this analysis that is different from what we're doing now? Do we, um, are we going to use different tools, ad additional consultations, bring in additional partners? Um, because it's, um, I, you know, I think we've all talked, those of us who have been involved in land use planning, um, for years have talked about the connection between transportation and land use, 
Um, it's so obvious, it almost goes without saying, but then really understanding what we're trying to accomplish by incorporating that into it. Are we trying to have more efficient land use patterns? Or are we trying to uh, optimize use of our transportation system? Are we trying to increase mobility? Are we trying to serve uh, underserved populations? What, what are we trying to do? And so I'm, um, just looking forward to seeing this actually fleshed out so that we know uh, really what what we're trying to accomplish uh, in this plan. Thank you. Um, and so I'll turn it over, um, I think, first to Executive Director Rex. And then if other members, I think there's some opportunity for other dialogue from members as well. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Levy, for, for raising this issue, um, particularly at the RTC the, um, on uh, yesterday morning. We had a great conversation about housing. I will tell you that when we were reading the new law, um, this was the one, of course, that just jumped out. I kind of said, whoa, okay. You know, it was one of those deals, right? Because we tangentially have been involved in housing, right, has always been part of our process. And intuitively, you know, there's an understanding of the relationship between land use, housing, transportation, right? But now we have some direction, albeit still a little gray and fuzzy about exactly what that means. And we will be getting further guidance from, from USDOT about exactly what is expected of MPOs and their, their, um, their role in coordination of housing and transportation. But we're excited about this opportunity. Um, I will suggest that we will have a more comprehensive conversation about what our role with you all, the board, at our board retreat on April 2nd. Um, so, so please, you know, if you can make that, please do. I think it, that'd be a good opportunity for us to establish some curbs about how you would like Dr. Cog and, and us, Dr. Cog collectively to, uh, to explore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Any other comments from folks? Not seeing any, if anyone would like to make a motion to frame the discussion, there can still be comments after the motion if there's more discussion on this. Director Levy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we approve a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2022-23 uh, Unified Planning Work Program for transportation planning in the Denver region. Thank you, is there a second, Director Flynn? I will second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion from members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And that takes us to our discussion on state legislative issues. So first we'll go through bills that we've previously taken positions on. And then um, once we're done with that, we'll go to new bills for consideration from the board. And I'll turn it over to Rich Morrow um, for a presentation. He's our Director of Legislative Affairs. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me uh, run quickly through the uh, four bills that the board took positions on last month. And then we'll get into the two new bills that we have um, on this agenda. So first of all, um, I think the, three, the first three bills, the board had positions of support with amendments. And I'm happy to report that uh, these bills, all three bills passed with board amendments uh, among others, but um, we were successful in uh, getting those amend, uh, bills amended satisfactorily. Uh, 1035, which is the uh, modernization of the older Coloradans Act, um, was passed uh, a couple weeks ago and actually has already passed the House of Representatives is, and is moving along to the Senate. Um, Senate Bill 1026, which is the next one, um, also was amended, um, including uh, recommendations from the Dr. Cog board and others to uh, expand the definitions to include things like e-bikes and e-scooters, um, low-speed conveyances, uh, et cetera. And um, that bill passed out of House Finance and still and is currently waiting uh, discussion on the uh, House floor. And uh, the next bill, 1028, 
um, also um, passed with actually uh, it had two amendments that it passed with and they were uh, two amendments that the Dr. Cog board had recommended one the one to add uh, a recommend uh, education component and um, another one to lower the the speed that is allowed to roll through the intersections uh, down to 10 miles an hour. Now there may be more discussion on uh, a couple of other issues I understand. Um, one of the ones that our board brought up was on age issues and um, there may still be some discussion going forward on that and I know CDOT had raised some issues that um, may be addressed uh, as well in future conversations. Uh, but our esteemed board chair did a great job testifying uh, in committee yesterday before it started snowing. And um, I don't know, Ashley, if you wanted to say anything or uh, I thought it went really well. I, I, I have nothing to add. I think that was a great summary of the bills. Um... Great, okay. Uh, the last bill on from last month, uh, Senate Bill 16, um, was postponed indefinitely in committee, so we won't see that one again. Um, so uh, let me just pause a minute and see if there's any uh, questions or comments on the bills from last month. Any questions from members on the bills from last month? All right, seeing none, thank you for that update, and we can move to the new bills. All right, and as we add into the uh, uh, move into the new bills, I, I will mention that we have uh, our two lobbyists, uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, uh, also attending virtually tonight. Uh, although I believe they are uh, actually uh, braving the uh, weather down at the state capitol, and so I want to wish them a safe travels home when they get a chance to go. Uh, but I'm ask them to jump in if I miss anything important here going forward. So with that, um, I will mention um, House Bill 79, or some, sorry, Senate Bill 79. Um, there's an aging related bill that uh, staff would uh, recommend, uh, ask that the board take a position of support on. Uh, this is a bill that relates to our work uh, in the field, particularly uh, uh, operating the ombudsman program in uh, nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Um, the bill uh, would uh, help fund uh, efforts to, uh, to provide education of caregivers in those facilities on the uh, specifics of Jerry, I'm sorry, of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and so forth. Um, and uh, it's something that's becoming more of an issue as we get more older adults uh, in this region. And um, with that, uh, we would recommend that uh, uh, the board uh, support that bill. Thank you. Any, any questions from members on that bill? Thank you. The first question or comment comes from um, Director Smith. Hey, uh, just a question on the funding of those training programs. So where's that funding coming from? Is it through the business or is it through a certain part of the, the state money? It's, um, yeah, it's, it's coming through some uh, state and federal money. I believe there's some federal grant money that's also available that by passing this bill where we will be able to access. Okay, and it would require that the facility would do the training or it would be another entity doing the training for the program or the facility? Yeah, I'm trying to remember specifically, I don't think the facilities just on their own would provide the, uh, the training. Um, it would be overseen by the Department of Public Health and Environment and um, they, would, uh, they, they would establish the rules for how that training should be provided. And that's as specific as I can get at this point on that part. Awesome, thanks Rachel, thanks for all you do. All right, thank you. Thank you, Director Smith. Any other questions on that one? All right, and I'll just remind everyone on when we take these positions, we need two thirds of the members that are voting and present. 
And so what I'll do is ask everybody to put their hands down um, and I'll take abstentions first. So I know how many I have to get to, to get to two thirds, if that's okay. And um, just for, for members, sometimes members in their communities are able to um, take a position because their, their council has given them the latitude to support something for the greater benefit of the region, even if it's not something specifically they've taken a position on. And in other cases, councils wanna specifically have taken positions um, before members go. So no hard feelings in any way if people need to um, take a position of abstain. So I just wanna make sure the three people who have their hands up are raising them to abstain and don't have comments. Um, any abstentions on taking a position on this one? All right, last chance for raising your virtual hand for abstention. And if you're not able to do it, um, if you just unmute yourself and let me know if you are not able to raise your virtual hand. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. So I will put your hands down or you can put your hands down. There we go. All right, um, was there any other discussion from members? I didn't wanna have cut that off if there was someone who wanted to ask another question. All right, not seeing any. All those in favor, please raise your hand of um, taking the staff recommendation of support. All right, so we needed 18 and we have 24 now. So thank you very much. And we can lower the hands. Thank you all for going through this kind of cumbersome process. It just <laughs> makes sure we have the right number of us to get to two thirds. And then any opposed? Thank you, everyone. We support the staff recommendation of support. Rich, would you like to tell us about the next new bill? Yes, I would. Uh, Senate, I'm sorry, gosh, House Bill 1138, um, which Geez, I think you all have already heard a lot about this bill, <laughs> so it's, it might save me a little extra um, uh, detail, but uh, just to recap on this bill, um, it basically uh, creates a tax credit for employers of 50% of the costs to provide alternative commuting options. The program is voluntary for employers with under 100 employees but required for employers with over 100 employees. Um, and uh, again, you've, you've heard some about the bill already. There's a little, little bit more detail in the summary uh, in the matrix. Uh, and uh, also is noted in the matrix that um, the, the basics of the bill do align with Dr. Cog board adopted policies. And, um, but I also, we also recommend or uh, understand that there, um, there may be different opinions from the board. So we're asking for board direction on this. Uh, we're also um, wanted to mention that the staff have uh, reviewed the bill and identified at least a couple of areas that we would want to amend. And uh, just to, to mention those briefly, I think the, the, the two notable areas relate to the development uh, of the annual commuter survey that the bill talks about and also the section that was mentioned before, but the section that um, provides for compensation for the transportation management groups uh, that provide assistance to the employers. Uh, we do have uh, Dr. Cog staff here available uh, to answer questions and provide more detail um, to the board. Um, and some of our staff can also explain how this bill uh, can directly affect uh, Dr. Cog's programs, particularly our way to go program. So with that, I'll stop and um, see if we have a uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Rich. Any members have discussion on this one? Any comments or questions? Director Mulvey. This one um, raises, sorry, I should speak with my face. This one raises some concerns um, for our municipality and our region because we feel it may dampen our ability to attract larger employers. It has some very good purposes and some very good intentions. And there are some very good things in it 
but there are some things about it that raise some concerns and the fact that it could, as I mentioned, dampen our ability to attract employers, particularly those that may be reticent to comply. And we've heard from some employers that have issues with this. And so, for example, an employer that has to, uh, you know, take a, a large building and rent space and then have to pay the um, pay back out for the parking spaces, that's difficult. And when our whole purpose is to attract a large employer so that people don't have to drive in the first place, and then they have this additional requirement on top of it, they feel like they just can't get ahead and why would they come here instead of going somewhere else? The other thing that concerns me is and concerns the employers that we hear from is that they, as the way to go um, public comment heard from Ms. Tavaros was, they recognize that some of the more spread out areas don't have as much access to or ability to build a uh, large transit. And we're at the edge of that area um, in our region. And the and so the purpose for this is to mandate something. And that's not always the best way to get something done. We're doing our best to bring those employers to us and to mandate something additional is actually counterproductive to it right now. And that's not what we're saying, it's what they're telling us. And so that's, that's my comment. I don't know if other uh, regions that are growing are hearing the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Any other comments, uh, Director Sandgren? Thank you. I echo um, Director Mulvey's concerns. And I think, um, you know, I guess I would like to know more about how is this, you know, the carrot and the stick that we saw the last time around um, being on the outskirts where we do have unfinished transportation projects with no end inside of when they will actually be finished. Um, a lot of our big employers are feeling the same kind of concerns. Um, Smart Commute Metro North, this was a big concern with a lot of our um, bigger employers. So I guess I'm still not seeing where um, communities that don't have transit options or don't have the mobility opportunities that others do, how is this going to help or hurt, uh, as Director Mulvey said, with some of our development opportunities moving into the future? Rich, do you want to take a start at that? And then if you want to turn it over to someone else? I think I'd rather turn that over to someone else. <laughs> Excellent. I'll, I'll see if um, Director Papsdorf would like to take a start there to tell us a little bit more about this bill, perhaps. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning Director. Thank you, first of all, for all the birthday wishes. Thank you, especially <laughs> to Doug, for bringing that up this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. So, um, as Rich said, um, there are two key components to this bill, uh, the first of which is um, a voluntary component for any employee, to, uh, any employer to pursue um, a, a corporate income tax uh, credit covering half of the cost of any expenditures that they incur providing certain transportation um, alternatives to their employees, but no requirement to do those things. Um, and then there is a mandate for large employers that have a um, uh, hundred or more employees at any one um, site um, to do a, uh, an annual commuter survey of their employees, provide um, information about transportation alternatives that may be available um, to them and um, the, uh, offer the pre-tax uh, transportation benefits um, that are allowed under the uh, federal IRS code. And the um, where possible, uh, there are some provisions and um, some caveats to it, but a, a parking cash out option available to employ, make that available to their employees. Um, and so I think that's, that's the big piece um, and our understanding of the mandate component of the bill. It is, uh, I will note that those, those mandates for large employees uh, phase in over time, starting with, I believe, the MPOs in the ozone non-attainment area, uh, which would include Dr. Cog, 
um, and then expand out to um, other areas of the state. Thank you very much. And I'll just ask Director Sanford if that answered your questions. It's helpful. I'm, I'm going to abstain because we haven't taken a position as a city, um, but I still have a lot of concerns. I, um, the burdens that this puts on our employers, I think it's still, you know, we're still coming back. There's still challenge from COVID and trying to come back from that. So any additional burdens or challenges added on to what they're trying to do to make it a comeback, um, I, I hesitate to support. So I'm going to abstain just because we haven't taken a position, but those are still the same concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sandgren. And next, Paul, I'm so sorry. I remember I said your last name wrong, incorrectly last time, and now I'm so nervous. And it's so ironic because our last name is Paul, quite similar. Paul Hazeman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Director Hazeman, please. I'm looking at the part about the parking space. So a lot of employers have parking areas, but they don't have reserved parking for most employees. Uh, what does that mean that you give compensation to an employee uh, and, and uh, he doesn't have or she doesn't have a parking place? How does that work? Um, Director Papstar? Um, Madam Chair, um, Director Haseman, I wish I could give you details. I honestly don't know. We were not involved in writing that provision. No. Um, uh, my understanding of the policy provision of that is that if the employer provides parking, for its employees, um, that um, if an employee were able to, to not take advantage of that parking, that the employer would offer a, a cash out payment to that, to that employee that wouldn't actually use the parking spot. It looks, looks like, like Rich, Rich. Rich might know more about the policy behind that. Rich? Yeah, no, no, actually not necessarily, but I did want to point out to you that um, Steve Erickson is also uh, deeply involved in this work with his way to grow program. So just keep in mind if one of if Ron or I or Doug can't answer questions, uh, Steve likely is able to as well. Steve, would you like to weigh in on this parking issue for us? Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. Yes, uh, Steve Erickson, Communications and Marketing Director at Dr. Cog, and in that role, I oversee the Way to Go program. I, I think Ron spelled it out as, as I understand it. Uh, again, ultimately, what this is um, working towards is, uh, you know, a situation where there would be uh, uh, less parking uh, required even in a, with a large employer. You're getting employees basically to commit to, um, you know, using other means to get to work other than a single occupant vehicle uh, in that way. So, uh, but I think Ron did a good job explaining that. Well, as just to continue, it's not clear to me. It looks like it's a burden on the employer to be paying compensation when he's not offering a reserve spot. Uh, or have tried to enforce it if an employee comes to work and uses a parking spot uh, on an occasion. So I, I'm uh, thinking that there's some looseness there. If you can't tighten that up, I'm not sure I can be in favor of this. Thank you, Director Hazeman. Director Levy? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'll say at the outset that I, that I uh, hope that we will take a position of support for this bill. Um, but I, I did have a question also, maybe Director Papstor or Erickson, uh, where you know the, it, the, the part of the bill that is a requirement, and, and there are very few of them, which is why I actually don't think it's gonna be a burden uh, on large employers, uh, but it does require uh, them to offer employees or qualified transportation fringe benefits, uh, um, that are defined in, in the federal tax code. Do you know, does anybody know what those are? I, I, um, and then I'd like to speak a little bit to the parking issue as well. Is there a member of staff or CDOT who knows about the, what, what the definition of those fringe benefits are as defined in the federal statutes? Madam Chair, Steve yeah. Erickson might be able to take the best shot. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, you know, the idea with these fringe benefits is that, that they're fairly easy for an employer to implement, as I understand it, it, you know, typically just takes 
a few hours to get this set up and you're basically using pre-tax dollars uh, to um, uh, to uh, an employee that would be, uh, let's say, purchasing uh, a transit pass on their own, or you know, there's other commute options included in that. But as a result of that, both the employer and the employee end up uh, uh, saving. Okay, thank you. And if I, if I could just follow up a little bit to some of the comments we've heard already. Director um, Lee. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wonder, just on your first point, I'm not, I'm, I think some of these questions that people have raised are not totally completely answered. And so if staff can come back when we talk about this again with some more detailed answers on some of the questions that have been raised, including including this most recent one. Director Levy? Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I, I think we are gonna wanna get a little more clarification, but I, uh, this is a very different bill than the um, than the E-TRIP regulation that we saw last year. And I, and I hope we really do look at it uh, with, fresh eyes and the tax credit part of it is voluntary. So that would not produce any kind of burden on employers. And for the, the, the part that, the only part I can find that is mandatory is the part that applies to large employers and that they do a commuter survey annually that they do offer um, qualified transportation fringe benefits. And we would we will wanna probably know a little bit more about what that is. Um, although the employer has the discretion to determine which benefits to offer. Uh, so there's even there, it sounds like there's a menu of, op of options, um, offer commuter choice information. And then on the, on the parking space, the, the way this is written to offer a cash allowance uh, to employees in lieu of a parking space, this would only apply if the employer provides a parking supplement or, or a subsidy, pardon me, to the employee, and they're able to reduce the number of paid parking spaces without a penalty. So for an employer, say, who has purchased a block of parking spaces in a parking structure to make available, uh, and they're not able to reduce that, so they're contractually obligated to pay, it sounds like this wouldn't apply. But I can really see the appeal of this because I have had been in, in situations where I have worked for an employer who has had paid parking uh, as, a, as a benefit which I did not use because I was able to take the bus to work, but I did not get a I did not get any sort of corresponding subsidy for for the bus, and so it it, it um, you know, when you have paid parking that's often seen as an inducement to drive because it takes takes some of the expense away, uh, and so I I think this is just an effort to uh, to um, offer subsidies for other forms of, of commuting, but um, I think it's very generous actually. So I think this is a great change. I think it's, um, it's really designed around incentives and inducements and not mandates. So I, I do hope that we'll take a position of support. Director Binkley. Hey y'all, um, I will not be turning my camera on because my house is a mess and y'all don't need to be looking at that. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry about that. But on a less granular level, I just have kind of a thought slash question slash for people who know more, please feel free to let me know any information I might not have. But um, I'm making the connection to something else here that's a little bit different, which is I'm not sure putting all of this, tying all of these things to an employer is really good. Like, I don't think it's worked well with health insurance, right? <laughs> like that's, as I get older, that's the first thing I think of as I'm changing jobs is like, what are the benefits going to be? And um, I'm just thinking it's something maybe the government should do more. I feel like employers aren't gonna be as equitable around these things a couple of other people have brought up. And I agree with the premise behind it, but I just feel uneasy about tying things to employers um, and jobs, especially with what we've seen just happen versus other ways to do that. So I'm just open to comments, feedbacks, information I might not have. Thank you, Director Binkley. 
Any other comments? Director Nermella. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little torn on this one only because I, I think of, I, I have worked out in California where we've, um, you know, with um, jurisdictions that have had significant transit access that have um, set transportation demand management um, goals and requirements similar to this, but even more um, significant with very um, precise uh, SO, you know, single occupancy vehicle reduction requirements. Um, but those are in conditions where there was great access to transit. And, um, you know, Westminster, we've had some lines cut. <laughs> um, and um, there are areas that just don't have, we have big employment centers that don't have access to much transit at all. So um, it's just something to think about in terms of universally applying this, um, that perhaps it could be a little more focused on um, strong transit or TOD rich communities. Um, you know, again, I'm not over, I'm not completely opposed to it because as an urban planner, I highly value this kind of, <laughs> this kind of work, but I'm also just balancing, uh, you know, like some of the comments before me, um, the, uh, you know, areas that don't have great transit access, you know, how will this be, um, reaching the goal that it is trying to reach? And what is the, you know, is there a specific reduction that this bill is trying to um, attain? And I guess one, one additional question I would have is um, if, an, if, if an employer with over a hundred employees, it, you know, doesn't meet these, how is this being monitored? And what is the impact if, they fail to comply. Um, and I, I'll Madam, turn that over. Madam Chair, I'll just say uh, in conversations we've had this at the staff level, we've not been able to identify anything like that in the bill. So I think it's left an open question. Um, others can correct me if I'm wrong. That's my understanding too, Rich. Dr. Nermilla? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. I, you know, that, that would be helpful to have this just be a little more focused. Thank you. Thanks. Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, I, uh, although the aspirations um, that the bill seeks are so important to our region, I think that we have lost as a state a lot of ground um, uh, in the last few years about being considered business friendly. And that concerns me very, very much. Um, I, I also feel that that threshold of 100 employees, I'm not sure that is a large business, at least in my mind, and with all businesses running so very lean, these days, a uh, lot of turnover, it does take the cost of staff time to do some of the reporting and filings and, and uh, you know, offers uh, and advertisement of these offers to employees. So I'm, I'm not in favor of, um, of supporting this as it's as it's written, I I just think it's not not business friendly, and we should be considering that as well. Thank you, Director Shaw. I'm not seeing any other Director Walton. Um, I liked this bill, um, or you know, pre previously when it came up, having a major employer uh, under construction with a facility in the city of Lafayette, um, we had some conversations and I just sort of let HR people know about the opportunity and also tried to spread or plant the seed with them that perhaps as they are under construction in future phases, 
they maybe would have the opportunity to consider not constructing as much parking or even save money by not having to construct a parking garage, um, which was an example as a benefit to, um, to businesses in the past. So I just wanted to share that, um, that, uh, that thought and comment and, um, and hopeful incentive to consider um, you know, kind of the long-term impact that something like this might have to bend the curve toward um, multimodal types and uh, alternate transportation options. Thank you, Director Walton. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that, I mean, to me, this this feels somewhat business friendly. <laughs> um, I know it is, you know, putting a, a potential um, cost on there. There's also some subsidies, but you know, what I'm thinking about is all the, the employees in our region who are really looking for alternative modes of transportation and other ways to get where they're going, um, particularly as they're having to live farther from um, their businesses. And it really is, you know, a, a strain on folks to have to um, spend so much time in their cars. And, and, you know, I think where one of the places we're coming from um, in Boulder in, in, um, um, looking on this bill of some favor is really thinking about how we can enable um, the folks who are commuting in to our city uh, to work at, at our companies um, to have some choice in how they get there so that their, their primary option isn't necessarily um, to take a car, which just adds so much stress to their days. Um, and, and this may be because we have so many people who commute in um, that you know we're, we're really looking at this. But um, in my mind, this is something that um, could provide a very appealing option, especially for larger businesses who are looking for, um, for uh, kind of additional things they can offer to employees as incentives to work there. Thank you, Director Spear. Director Coombs? Um, yeah, so just adding on to what Director Spear just said, I think there are a lot of options for how businesses can comply with this. So it's not everybody has to take the bus, right? It includes telecommuting options. It includes carpooling, right? It's not all about transit. Of course, we want to have good transit and we want to incentivize the use of transit where it's available, but there are other options that are included in the bill. Um, and as far as the fringe benefits, I know for the city of Aurora, we just have a voluntary, you can pre-tax contribute to a um, transportation savings account that you then have to use for transit related costs. So. Um, it could be something as simple as that. Maybe we can get a little clarification on if that's the type of fringe benefit that's under discussion. Um, but that's something that's voluntary for the employee, easy for the employer to implement, especially if you are a large entity. Um, and so that, in that sense, it does not seem to me to be overly burdensome. And it really does, again, give incentives for folks to include those types of programs. So it's not demanding that, um, that they do something specific, but only incentivizing that they um, look into these various options. So it seems way more flexible than the eTrip program that we saw before um, and gives both businesses and uh, workers, more opportunities, more options, um, more ways to just do something other than drive to and from work every day. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Coombs. Director Lindstedt. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. Um, I think you know, uh, this is a, a really uh, dynamic and, and thoughtful compromise, especially uh, from the discussions we've had for over the last year. Um, so I, I think this is a, a really good, uh, thoughtful way to move forward and that our, our businesses, you know, have a, have a variety of options uh, to make this work and, you know, to, to reduce congestion and increase multimodal use uh, throughout the region. So um, I just, I, I, I'm very appreciative of the, the thoughtful, um, uh, discussions and, and all the work that happened uh, to get this bill forward, because I, I think it really is a, an improvement um, from what we've seen in the last year. So um, I, I hope we can support this tonight. 
Thank you, Director Lindstedt. And I just wanna give folks a chance who haven't had a chance to speak once um, a chance and then I'll go through and we can take second comments from folks. Are there any people who haven't had a chance to speak on this topic that would like to add anything in? Um, I'll just add my comments um, for a moment. It, you know, I, I think, um, I actually think this is a very positive bill. I think it helps us achieve our greenhouse gas goals in a way that is um, very voluntary and flexible. I, I am concerned at how um, there's a lot of confusion and, and um, information gaps that, that are present tonight. So I would really hope that we could get more information for everyone. Um, so that we could at least all have the same basis of information to be making the decision off of. Um, there are large employers in our area that voluntarily do um, some of these things like the paying for parking to reduce their parking and providing transit passes and things like that. And um, the employees and the employers like it very much. Um, it's seen as a benefit. Um, there are even some companies that are giving, you know, like days off if you carpool and some other incentives to try to reduce some of the impact. So I think there are a lot of things that can happen. Um, I think having the tax credit is a benefit. Um, and, and just sort of backing out, um, when you think about how we fund some of our multimodal solutions in the region, there, there is a lot of cost that's um, shifted to sales taxpayers. Um, which is a combination of different users, but I think this recognizes that employers have been asking for more access to transit service because they want people to be able to get to work. And we continue to see in our employment centers, employers asking us to increase the amount of transit and transportation access. And I see this as a way to helping um, meet the desire that they have collaboratively um, to increase access for their employees to get to work. So I think this is positive, but I, I, I just guess um, if, if there is so much conflict tonight, I would encourage us to monitor this perhaps until we can get everyone's questions answered um, so that we can have at least an equal basis of information to make the decision off of next month. Um, so going through again for folks, um, uh, Rich Morrow, did you wanna say something? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd be happy to, although I would, maybe I could wait till after all of the board members speak, uh, but what I was gonna mention was uh, picking up on what you just said, a, a couple of areas where staff has identified, we could seek amendments, um, particularly as, as the bill uh, affects Dr. Cog and its programs. Uh, and so, you know, the board can consider alternate, I guess, positions, like you mentioned, monitor or amend or, or that sort of thing too. Did you want to tell us about any? But I could go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you go ahead sure, just so we'll that just... when people go the second time, if they want to respond to your comment. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, again, I'll ask the rest of our staff to jump in if I forget something. But um, one is uh, there seems to be a disconnect actually in the bill from what's mentioned in the summary to what's actually in the text of the bill, uh, where when it talks about the, uh, let's see, it's CDOT and the Colorado Energy Office collaborating to pro develop an annual employer commuter survey. In the summary, it says CDOT, the energy office and the MPOs. Uh, in the bill, MPOs are left out of the language. And in talking to proponents, that appears to have been an oversight that we should have the MPOs mentioned in the bill. So we'd like an opportunity to pursue that. And then the second one, is in the uh, section toward the end of the bill where it directs funding to the TMOs and TMAs to help uh, pay for their costs in assisting employers with these uh, elements that they would uh, be working on. Uh, since Dr. Cog, and I think Steve would, would correct me, his program already works with like a thousand different employers or something, um, the, the MPOs would be involved in uh, also helping employers do this work that we ought to also be included in the bill to uh, get some compensation for our efforts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morrow. And so Director Levy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I like your idea that we should monitor uh, this and while well, we get a little more information, but um, I, I guess I just wanna say, I, I think from listening to the comments, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, I, I think there's a misperception about what the bill does because 
there's so little of it that is actually mandatory. It is, it, it, the bulk of it is about incentives. And I, I don't re recall which of the directors um, mentioned, um, have, you know, people wanting options and, and that's what the bill offers is, uh, is a tax credit for providing those, those options. Um, none of that is mandatory. Uh, and if you don't want to go through the burden of the reporting that's necessary to claim the tax credit, you don't have to. So the bulk of the bill is really trying to just reward employers that want to do things because some of them co are costly and it gives them a tax credit. And again, just going back to the only part that I see here that would be mandatory for employers of 100 or more would be to simply create a survey, uh, a commuter survey, uh, to find out about commuting patterns and preferences, um, offering one of the fringe benefits at the employer's choice. And there, I do think we need to know what those are to, to see whether those would be widely available. But uh, offer isn't the same as requiring employees to accept that or anything, just make available. Uh, offer commuter choice information, again, just make information available, and then offer a cash allowance in lieu of parking. And um, it's not penalizing an employer for providing parking. It's not requiring them to reduce the amount of parking. So I think I see this as a very permissive bill. And if anything, I would be concerned that it does, doesn't go very far and, and may not actually have much effect in the long run. And to the, I, I heard the concerns about uh, large employers in the areas that don't, aren't transit rich. And I, I, I get that concern, but I, I don't see where this bill would uh, would would um, you know impose any requirements that would be difficult to meet in a non-transit rich area. So I th I think it's a quite benign bill, and uh, and I think we should just monitor it for now until we can find out more about what those uh, employee the the fringe benefits are that would be required because I think that's the only thing that that um, is mandatory that that could be a burden, depending on what that is. Director Papstar. Thank you. Um, I will qualify this by saying I'm, <clears throat> I'm not, uh, not only am I not an attorney, I'm not a tax attorney. So do not, this does not constitute tax advice for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am on the IRS website and qualified transportation benefits are um, a ride. I'm, a, I'm not gonna read everything verbatim, but it basically, a van pool uh, subsidy for employees, a ride in a van pool, um, a transit pass or qualified parking. And qualified parking is basically providing carpool parking, sort of advantaged um, parking for your employees. Those are, the, those are the three qualified transportation benefits according to the IRS website and my 10 minutes of research. Thank you. Thank you, Director Papsdorf. Um, Director Nermella. Thank you for the additional op uh, opportunity. Um, I also like the idea of um, monitoring this. So we can get a little more detail. Um, I, I agree with Director Le uh, Levy that uh, in some areas, I would love to see us move so much further towards um, TDM work throughout the state. Um, I just, uh, one thing that would be helpful to understand for me would be, um, I think somebody had mentioned that the car, the cash, parking cash out would not apply to employers that had to, um, you know, a lot of employers, whether, you know, in, often in urban settings, um, when they lease their, um, their space, they will pay for a certain amount of parking, either tied to that specific building or um, project or, um, they lease in, in another build, um, in another parking garage. And so they're paying for parking. Um, so I'd just be curious to know if there is truly uh, some uh, portion of the bill that talks about 
um, where that cash out would not apply. Um, and then again, I'll just underline the monitoring and enforcement. I think how is it enforced? What are the penalties would be important for employers um, and us as cities to understand. And then finally, um, it would be, I, I, I definitely support the MPO having um, uh, the opportunity to um, get some funding to help assist employers because I'm seeing, you know, that a commuter survey can be kind of uh, produced and hopefully utilized by employers so they wouldn't have to do their, you know, so obviously you're creating this level of consistency um, for everybody um, to survey their employees, but any other additional assistance that could be um, brought from the MPO to employers, they could tap into a website, let's say, and hit their location and get some information that helps them create their commuter choice information or something like that. So yeah, that's. Thank you, Director Nermilla. Um, Mr. Erickson. Yeah, I'll just uh, quickly respond to uh, that that excellent question, uh, Director Nermella. And and I will say that uh, you know this region is probably better positioned to support uh, a bill like this uh, than just about any other region in the country that's implemented one. Um, the Way to Go program here at Dr. Cog. Uh, actually manages things like the Vanpool program and our Guaranteed Ride Home program and has a lot of sort of foundational uh, assets in place. Um, Audrey Devaros in her, in her public comments mentioned our My Way to Go platform. That's the platform we use for trip planning and tracking and ride matching. And we use it for employer campaigns all the time. Uh, we have enhanced that platform just in the last year to basically facilitate uh, both employer assessments, what are you doing today in the workplace, as well as to have a template for an employee survey. Now, it might be that uh, if this were to pass, we would work with CDOT and, and make subtle changes to that, but to that survey, but it would be a very simple process uh, for an employer to actually distribute an employee survey and get those results back in. We're able to collect all that data and, and distribute it or report it out really in, in any, way, any way we need to. So really a lot of the assets uh, are in place really to support this well. And to Rich's point, yeah, in, in terms of funding, um, Dr. Cobb and our outreach staff in the Way to Go partnership and program uh, cover roughly 40% of those large employers in our region. Thank you. Um, next, we have Director Mulvey. Thank you. Um, to hopefully wrap up a little bit, um, I, you know, I've worked in three different metropolitan regions, and I uh, want to reflect on what we've heard here. And we, this discussion really does emphasize that we have a lot of collaborative discussion and reflection to undertake we all really need to take a closer look at this bill and what it's really doing and not doing. And our discussion really emphasizes that we have a lot of different profiles. We have some cities where most people commute in. We have other cities where most people stay. We have other cities where there's a belief that people are getting rides home from work. We have other places where that's just not happening. And then we have other cities that have access to tra public transit in the form of bus and others where it's in the form of a train. There are just plain old different profiles and that needs to be considered in this bill. And we need to have perhaps more discussion to make sure that there's really true compromise that we're getting very close to. William was so right. We are the, close to it. We're just really not there, which this conversation emphasizes. We also have a difference of opinion clearly as to whether or not our employers are really asking for this. Some of us say we're hearing from employers that do, and some of us say we're hearing from employers that don't. As an example, I can say, you know, is this sized right? A mid-sized law firm is gonna have attorneys that need a car because they need the car to go somewhere to do their job but then they have a bunch of employees that have to get to work every day, but that office is situated somewhere that there is no van pool. 
and there is no train that's going to take them there every day. So what do you do then? Because their rent is includes the parking spot. And so to also answer something else, yes, I've had the fringe benefit of both the train pass and the van pool. And um, the third one, I forget what you mentioned, oh, the parking space. So yeah, they really all are available, but they do take up extra administrative costs on the part of the employer. So they have to administer that. And for an, for an employee base that's only 100, that may or may not be possible. So I do think that this does need to, you know, monitor is really, Ashley, Madam Chair, the right way to go in my view, or to just take a really big pause where we really seem to be, even those of us that, that like this, some of these ideas, really seem to have some big questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Teal. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I uh, I don't know if we're to a point for, for the emotion yet, but um, I, I too would like to echo what we've heard that perhaps this is a bill that we want to monitor. And uh, I'd just like to point out, um, in addition to the comments from Director Mulvey, um, the, the fact that, you know, we are in an inflationary uh, environment right now. And it's uh, wage inflation is starting to hit our employers. We're starting to hear that from our employers down in Douglas County, that uh, wage inflation is starting to strike them at a time when they are still, um, first of all, they're in a quarter and they're within their budget. And uh, I should say they're within their budget cycle. And so the I, I kind of take issue uh, with the comment made by my, my very honorable colleague from Boulder um, in that this is, you know, um, uh, fairly benign of a requirement, but it's still one more requirement when our employers are in a very high pressure situation of having to divert mid budget cycle, um, you know, resources in order to just keep their employees on staff. So um, I think there's, uh, in addition to all the gaps, I too would speak in favor of uh, entertaining a motion uh, to monitor this bill until we see some of those gaps filled. I do think we should probably give direction to Rich if that's possible, or at the very least, I think Rich has been monitoring some of the comments. Oh, sure. Yeah. Understands, Rich, I think you understand the support of the proposed amendments that you brought to us, that we would get behind that, but then also based on the conversation, I know Rich is really good at picking up on other things to probably bring uh, to our legislators in consideration of this bill. So, I wish I could find the thumbs up button here. That was good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I seriously wanted to applaud when we were, you know, especially Ashley's comments, pardon me, Madam Chair's comments earlier. I, I couldn't find my applause button, but um, <laughs> so Madam Chair, uh, I don't know if we're complete enough in our discussion to have a motion to monitor uh, but I would speak in favor of taking that action at the conclusion of the discussion. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Mauer. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'm not going to turn on my camera. My internet's a little unstable tonight. And I just, I want to just tell people that um, I worked uh, for an employer. There was about 650 employees metro area. And we were offered a, um, the RTD pass. And, you know, you can't always use, you know, like the light rails or a bus or whatever wasn't always available. But I tell you what it did do is when it, it was a benefit, because if you had wanted to go do something uh, like entertainment or game or something, you could use that pass. So that really was a benefit to the employees. It was a real plus. And, and I kind of look at it as a way to, it's another thing to attract employees, you know, when people are trying to find people. Um, the one thing that I saw was a, a missed opportunity though, because I went back and asked, because um, they had several different um, options that you could use for um, other than driving your vehicle. 
is they never surveyed or, or kept any type of data on what was used or how it was used. So um, I like really the survey, even though it's a pain to prove a point. So, and I am good with monitoring and thank you. Thank you, Director Mauer, Director Wheelock. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I will be um, um, willing to vote for a monitor position this evening, um, but I would also be willing to vote for a support position based on the, the preponderance of the comments that I've heard this evening and that were, I felt the most compelling for me. Uh, I think it's mostly that this is primarily um, uh, elective on the part of the employees for the most part. They're not all of it, but most of it is not required. And most of it is not mandatory. Um, there are multiple ways to take advantage of it that go beyond RTD um, or a number of other uh, methods that you can use. Uh, I think that the, the, the ability to take advantage of it is rich. And I think that the thoughts about transit rich areas is changing as we become more transit rich, rich um, uh, throughout the entire region. Uh, there are areas like CDOT's, uh, CDOT's um, Pegasus program, which will bring uh, many transit public, uh, many uh, bus, buses offering far more diverse routing and, and schedules than we've seen with some of the other bus services before. As these develop, that's only evolving. And the other thing that's evolving is, um, is the workforce. The workforce is asking for these kinds of solutions. And so if employers are having a far, hard time finding uh, employees and they can get a tax credit um, as opposed to a write-off for providing those kinds of services and benefits. It's really an incentivization for those people who are smart enough in trying to find a workforce to provide the workforce what it's really looking for. I think at the end of the day, this would be successful. I'm sure we can find ways to improve it if we monitor it and, and find amendments that we wish to seek, but I think it's a great bill. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wheelock. I'm not seeing any other hands, and so I'll turn it back over to Director Teal to frame the discussion with the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. If it uh, pleases the board, I'd like to make a motion to take a position of monitor on House Bill 1138. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Mauer? Second. Thank you, Director Mauer and um, Director Hazeman. You're very good. He just just chime in to make the second. Thank you very much. So I just want to um, sort of see by a nod from folks. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion around the the points that uh, Rich made around uh, asking the sponsors to look at correcting the things around the MPO with the funding of the MPO and things. I, that seems like the board would um, overwhelmingly support that kind of direction. I see a lot of head nodding. Is there anyone that felt very differently about that that wants to bring up any points or other different points, Director Hazeman? I really do you know, think the bill is a good one that we should you know, eventually get behind it. I think there were some gaps in terms of what we understand and I'd be look forward to hearing uh, what additional information is brought forward because I, we need to do as much as we can to support public transportation in the metropolitan area. Thank you, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just closed the bill, so I can't point to language, but I, I think that we also might want to explore, uh, have, have Rich explore with the bill sponsors whether uh, the the uh, requirements for the large employers could be modified there because I, I think what that tr the federal IRS code fringe benefits um, considers is pretty narrow and I, I think that may not benefit a lot of people what's actually on that list the van pool the transit pass and um, uh, parking for carpools. Uh, I think there's a, a bicycle commuter provision in there as well. And, and maybe expanding that to include some of those items that are on the, uh, the um, list of um, things for which you can get a tax credit might be helpful. And it might actually make the bill a little bit more effective because I could see employers of 100 or more offering these things. And, and nobody accepting it because they may be located in an area for which that's just not helpful. So I think the bill could be improved uh, if there were more options to those employers that are 100 or more. 
Thank you, Director Levy. Director Teal. Well, Madam Chair, I, it's usually not our practice. Uh, the motion is to, mo uh, um, excuse me, to monitor. However, I would think it is in the spirit of the motion to have direction given to Rich to pursue some of these amendments that have been articulated by other members. Thank you. And does the second to agree? Um, I believe it was um, a Director Maurer. Yes, I agree. Thank you. And so um, the, the vote for this evening, and I'll turn it back over to the folks that have their hands up still just to get the final comments in, um, would be to uh, take a position of monitor, but to give direction of staff to work with the bill sponsors to get some of our questions addressed, and then to specifically address the things that Rich brought up and some of the other suggestions from members tonight. Great, and so um, Director Hazeman. Yes. It's a, a legacy ham, sorry about that. Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In the, uh, in the spirit of, of going out to try to, to monitor and try to get some more information, there were a couple of things that I had questions about. It talks about for large employers, I believe, to offer qualified uh, transportation benefits uh, related to the federal, and I gotta, I gotta get to another screen here. Um, that comply with the, uh, Dep the Federal Department of Transportation or something like that. There was also something about offering a cash allowance in lieu of a parking, uh, the parking, but it said under certain circumstances in the, in the summary that I read. And then I, if there was some more information about the $250,000 for the transportation management associations and how that would, how that would sort of interact with the, um, the employers that it, that may be, uh, use uh, developing these plans for their transportation. So those are some of the issues that I uh, thought we might get some clarity on. Thank you. Thank you, Director Starker. Those are inclusive of the motion. So thank you very much. Any other discussion from members? All right. And so just once again on these, um, we have to have two thirds of members voting in present um, to be able to take a position. So if there are any members that are abstaining on taking a position on this bill, would you please raise your hand at this time if you're abstaining? Thank you very much. And you can put your hands down, please. And then all those in favor of taking a position of monitor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. You can put your hands down. Any, oh, I'll just wait, there's still two. Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The board of directors approves a position of monitor. Thank you, Rich. Do you have any other new bills for us this evening? I do not, but I could answer Director uh, Starker's, one of his questions right now, if you want. <laughs> that, that would be great. <laughs> um, on the, uh, the uh, parking, the provision here says offer a cash allowance to employees in lieu of a parking space. This requirement only applies to large employers who provide a parking subsidy to employees and are able to reduce the number of paid parking spaces without penalty. Does that help? Thank you, Rich. And so um, Executive Director Rex, if you could before the next meeting, uh, either include in the board packet for next time or get a memo out to members on some of these questions. Yeah. I think that would help the discussion a lot. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much to everybody for the robust debate there. And that takes us to our next agenda um, item, which is an informational briefing. We're going to hear about the Reimagine RTD update. If you're following along in the packet, it's attachment L. Matthew Helfen, our senior transportation planner in transportation planning and operations, is going to tell us about this tonight. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, good evening, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, we imagine RTD is an effort to forecast the changing transportation needs of our region. And when complete, RTD intends uh, that this process will identify comprehensive strategies to better connect people and places. A key component of this project 
it's developing a system op optimization plan. RTD released a draft plan for public review in early January, and public comments on this plan have been extended to March 9th. Uh, this briefing contains a slightly updated PowerPoint that includes the extended uh, period for public comment and more information on uh, workforce challenges. The updated presentation will be made available to everyone. And we have Bill Van Meter from RTD here to provide the overview and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Van Meter. Thank you, Chair and Matthew. I am working on my screen share. I hope I am successful. You are. Awesome. So I understand as well that I am supposed to start my presentation by wishing Ron Papsdorf a happy <laughs> birthday. Um, so today I have the opportunity to provide a very brief um, overview of the Reimagine RTD. I'm going to focus primarily on the system optimization plan, which, as Matthew just noted, um, the extent uh, the co public comment period for has been extended. That was an awkward construct of a sentence, but more on that as we move along. I want to give you an update on the public engagement, which has been extended again on the system optimization plan until March 9th. Touch briefly on the mobility plan for the future as well. So I've talked about it. There's a system optimization plan. I will slip and refer to it as the SOP during this presentation. Um, the acronym SOP stands for the system optimization plan. That's an effort we're currently un underway on and in the midst of to redesign transit services in the short to midterm for RTD, balancing travel needs in the region with our budgetary limitations as well as our workforce limitations. We're also in parallel working on the mobility plan for the future, identifying long-term strategies for RTD and public transit in the metro area on a time frame that <clears throat> corresponds with and informs the regional transportation plan for Dr. Cog. So I won't read all of the bullets on this slide in the interest of time, but this slide does identify the key factors or key reasons for proceeding with a system optimization plan. Um, some of the targets in terms of increasing ridership and, and um, addressing service performance and efficiency, remaining competitive, addressing needs and changing, changing travel needs are, that have uh, occurred as a result of the pandemic. Another slide that depicts the guiding principles that our board of directors adopted for RTD um, in 20, early 2021, mobility, optimizing based on current travel patterns and future anticipated pa patterns, equity, focusing on social equity in Title VI, which was a real recognized strength of RTD's service provision during the ongoing pandemic, addressing financial constraints, our workforce constraints as well, looking for opportunities for partnership and sustainability. Those were the goals set out by RTD. Some of the challenges, one, 20, nearly 2,400 square mile service area and those competing demands regarding balancing coverage and service throughout this large district that we um, serve as well as um, the interplay between between that and providing um, a solid core network. I've addressed and talked a little bit about our financial challenges. We also have workforce challenges. The first line here um, depicts RTD's experience in 2021 regarding bus operators. We were able to hire 97 new bus operators in 2021. 167 left RTD. Um, that downward trajectory is one that we are laser focused on reversing. 
but we have 147 vacancies. That's an 18% vacancy rate for bus operators today. Similarly, for other key support staff, mechanics, cleaners, um, and other folks, we have some pretty sizable vacancies today. And then I'll um, pull your attention to the bottom line, which shows that in order to even achieve the service levels that we're projecting, about a 20% increase over what we're providing today with the system optimization plan, we need to onboard 250 to 400 additional bus operators. A real challenge for our TD. Some of the goals for our system optimization plan or SOP, simplification, having well-defined routes, getting rid of irregular, irregular trip patterns and having more consistent service spans, when service starts each morning and when it ends each evening, and improving reliability. One of the key ways to do that is eliminating very long routes. The longer the route, the more um, unanticipated traffic, congestion, um, and other factors can impact the on-time performance for a route. Many of you may have seen this graphic before. We're working on developing and identifying four service categories as part of the system optimization plan. Um, unique service types. This first layer shows our rail network, the current rail network, with a layer on of the community or local routes. Um, layering on then commute routes, although there's a less of a focus moving forward on commute routes than we've had historically at RTD. They're still a key piece of the puzzle from um, um, key destinations such as the airport, the Southeast Corridor, Denver Tech Center. I've now, um, uh, downtown Boulder, I've now the US 36 quarter now set myself up for failure by not identifying all of the key um, uh, destinations and commute patterns in the region, but we are still focused on that. Our connect routes, local bus and rail routes connect to the backbone of the service, which are, are the rail services the and the core services layered on top of there. So there's some metrics on this slide. In the interest of time, I won't read them all, but I want to um, emphasize that one of the things that's happening is an improvement in service, access to 15 minute or better service for many folks throughout the district, especially those um, in communities who rely on transit for their tra transportation needs as well as a 20% increase in midday service. So again, the system optimization plan is positing a 20 plus percent increase over our current service levels. So we're pretty excited about that, even with the um, financial and workforce constraints that we have. So it will be requisite on RTD to implement this over time. We don't have particularly the human capital resources today um, to be able to implement the SLP in one fell swoop. So in terms of implementation, the project team will be reviewing and analyzing all of the comments we are receiving from um, December through March 9th, developing a revised SLP, trying to incorporate and address as many of those comments as possible. A vast majority of the comments on the SOP are requests for additional service. Based on our funding and workforce limitations, it's gonna be difficult to address all of those satisfactorily, but we will work to do the best that we can. And as I was saying, SOP, System Optimization Plan Implementation, will be phased through the next four or five years through 2027. Our board of directors um, requested that staff and our general manager and CEO Johnson look at the opportunity to extend comment and public engagement on this key piece of our plan, our service for the next five years, beyond the original February 9th date that um, we had established that is being implemented. We informed our board about that last week, 
And so in an ongoing manner, we will continue doing a number of the pieces of outreach to key stakeholders, to our customers, and to the public at large that we have been doing throughout the engagement for the system optimization plan. Additionally, in February, we're putting collateral on our buses and trains to reach our customers. We're increasing our media outreach, um, digital ads and PIDs, holding an additional public meeting, Spanish outreach and public meeting, and doing other um, layering on of work to reach out to our constituents, to our public. To date, we have received over a thousand comments. Broad geographic area, there's a map showing a pinpoint of where those comments have come from. As I noted, a lot of interest in um, adding or enhancing existing transit services adding stops, improving access to stations. Over 80% of the, of the comments are in that direction, and we're working to compile that and provide that information for our board of directors, for the public, and um, for others at large. Real quickly, mobility plan for the future workflow. Parallel, looking at 2050, looking at how we can complement and support the longer term goals and targets of the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Plan and aligning with that 2050 time frame. I won't try to read everything on this, but we are moving along and addressing key items such as district boundaries and the size of the district workforce challenges, parking access, mobility as a service, fleet electrification, bus and rail fleet maintenance plans. Our financial plans, constraints and opportunities, fast tracks, and um, potential impacts from things such as TABOR on RTD's financials, financial capabilities to deliver services in the future. That, Chair and colleagues, concludes my attempt. Hopefully, you um, found it somewhat, my attempt to update you on Reimagine, hopefully, you found it somewhat engaging and informative. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Um, any questions from members on this topic tonight? I hope everybody has a chance to review the system optimization plan within your team. Um, this is pretty transformational work um, from RTD and no easy task that you all are undertaking um, given the realities of what's happened with the pandemic and everything. I guess I'll just, um, while people are thinking about other questions and getting their hands up, ask um, the group, maybe it would be appropriate for us as the regional um, planning organization, Metro metropolitan planning organization, um, to have our staff go through this um, and perhaps make some comments before the deadline, just very high level, look at this and sort of compare it to Metro Vision. Um, take a look at this and compare it to the targets that have been set for our region for the greenhouse gas rulemaking and sort of just even if it's not making any judgments one way or another, but just comparing them to those things and making those comments known um, for the RTD board just so they know where we're coming from. I wonder what folks would think about that. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair Stolson. Uh, Bill, uh, could you uh, clarify, do the numbers, the statistics, the figures that you gave there on staffing and on, on the levels of service, et cetera, are they exclusive of the P3 Denver Transit operators? Does that include the commuter rail lines and their staffing and their issues? Um, the, no, those, those numbers, I am virtually certain, um, are RTD's staffing experience, not our contracted services. Okay, uh, would you be able to incorporate uh, what DTO is going through? Because I see every day on my rider alerts, I see cancellations of trips because of staff shortages on the A line. And so just curious uh, if they are at the same level of, uh, of uh, staff uh, shortages as the RTD operated staff are, uh, it'd be helpful to know that as well. I can look into that. I'm not certain how readily available that sort of information is as a private um, concern corporation, sure. their contractual um, requirements with RTD might not 
afford us the opportunity for that look inside. I don't know. As I should have recalled, right? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Not seeing any other hands, um, or really reaction. So I wonder, um, I love to give the next chairman some additional work perhaps, but maybe the, the incoming chair, um, uh, Director Flynn could work with the executive director to kind of look at this and maybe make some high level comments that we could provide from Dr. Cog. Does that seem um, acceptable to the group? Director Levy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think we should consider doing that or uh, and um, think about the areas in which we would want to have input. Transit uh, RTD is so important to achieving the greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's so important to mobility, reducing VMT, everything that Dr. Cog works on. And, um, and given that this is going to set the direction of ridership. Um, I think I think Dr. Cog ought to provide some comments. So I'd be in favor of of doing that. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm on the other screen, just looking at the calendar. Uh, uh, Doug, yeah, can I ask you? Are we uh, at the uh, on in March? Are we having a board workshop in March? And I'm not recalling that right offhand. Yes, we are. We're having a board workshop on March 2nd. Would it be possible to get a, a, a presentation on uh, the, the Reimagine RTD and, and solicit uh, any comments from the board? Because public comment closing a week later uh, doesn't give us a lot of lead time to delve into that. Yeah, I'm sure we can provide a draft um, okay. to the board. That has not given us much time, though, with regards to getting in the packet. It might be a little late um, because sure. that would be. You know, the packet goes out on Wednesday. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get with staff and we'll figure something out. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Director Maurer. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just so I'm part of the Reimagine RTD. And um, surprising, they sent this out some time ago and um, went to my council. They really didn't have anything to say at that time. However, RTD has reached out again um, and said, you know, we're adding more time on. So they, I don't know how many other agencies they did this with. I felt it was everybody, but yes, my agency took it upon themselves that they will meet with every city council person and go through this SOP plan. And I just thought, is, is some of that going on besides just my agency? Yes, Director Maurer, I know it at least is in our area too. So I know there there's some additional out, outreach happening. So, well, and I guess the reason I brought that up is because yes, we will provide our comments. So that'll help with um, Dr. Cog not having to get comments from us anyway. Thank you very much, Director Maurer. Any other comments on this topic tonight? All right, seeing none, that takes us to our Regional Vision Zero. Um, educational marketing campaign. It's attachment M in the packet. And Steve Erickson, our director in communications and marketing is going to tell us about this. Yes, good evening again, everyone. I, I, I feel compelled to wish Ron Papstorf a happy birthday. I, I am compelled to, to wish you a happy birthday, Ron. Um, uh, probably most of you know that uh, the board adopted uh, a plan taking action on regional vision zero um, uh, more than a year ago. Uh, and that the vision zero initiative is uh, uh, establishing a target for zero fatalities or serious injuries on our transportation system. And it's my pleasure tonight really to hand this off to a marketing agency a representative, uh, the president of Hill Avium, Linda Hill, to sort of describe uh, the campaign that we undertook this, uh, this last year. So take it away, Linda. Thank you, Steve. Can everybody hear me? Just do a quick nod. Okay, yes. great. I am gonna share my screen and then I will introduce our creative director that is with us as well. So can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up. Thank you so much. Um, first off, thank you. Um, we know it's late and we are keeping this at 15 minutes, uh, which as a communications agency is a great thing to do. So with me today is Gordy Hirsch, who is our creative director. And I uh, just wanted to thank everybody again for your time. It's been a pleasure to work with Steve and his team. And then obviously um, our team and some of the partners that 
uh, help put this whole campaign together. So we're going to give a really brief overview of, of the program uh, launch into the creative that has run, um, discuss a little bit of the media strategy and then what the PR um, strategy was as well. And as most of you are aware, um, uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, obviously Dr. Cog, approved moving forward with this public education campaign focused on the regional Vision Zero work plan in April of 20. Um, what we were able to do is really pour through a lot of the great research that Dr. Cog provided to us, uh, which included the regional v, uh, Vision Zero work plan and then other information that was sourced from CDOT and NH. TSA, as well as there were some other research um, pieces from uh, AAA. And we came back uh, with three strategic directions, which we'll get into in just a moment. Um, each of those directions were tested with our core audiences, which I will get to in just a moment as well. And then on the program background, Steve covered a little bit of this um, already about the transportation safety philosophy that Vision Zero is. And I think the biggest things are there's six objectives that are in existence with 25 action initiatives. The overall program goals are to achieve the zero traffic deaths by 2040 and achieve zero serious injuries by 2045. So we were um, uh, selected to go ahead and handle the public information campaign. And um, first and foremost, the, the piece that we came away with, with re from all of the wonderful research that was provided was we're in a very different um, place today uh, than we were, let's say three years ago. Um, we've got that double whammy of the pandemic and an economic downturn. And what we were finding is that the audiences that we were speaking to are not feeling in control. And so our research hit upon a very, very simple insight. People tended to care more and act more on things that they felt were, in the, were within their control. Um, as I mentioned before, the research uh, that we used and then the strategic directions we came up with we um, tested and the one that rose to the top, the very tip top was slow speeders proved to be the most successful. And when we say slow speeders, it was really that term that grabbed people's attention. Um, and if it's okay, I'll just read this briefly and then we'll jump right into the creative. So one of the deadliest kind of speed, kinds of speeding doesn't look like speeding at all. There's an argument to be made that the most dangerous kind of speeding is going 40 miles per hour on a suburban street, not blazing down a rural highway at 85 miles per hour. The majority of fatal crashes don't happen on highways. They happen in suburban neighborhoods or on city streets. A vehicle traveling at 40 miles per hour is 60% more likely to cause injury or fatality to a pedestrian than one just going 20 miles per hour. The most dangerous speeder is you, it's me, it's all of us driving to where we need to be, just a little over the speed limit. So this idea was built on that very simple insight about speeding that people really didn't understand and that one of the deadliest kinds of speeding happens really on our busy suburban streets and doesn't really look like speeding at all. So our communication objectives and then the audience, uh, primarily it was increasing awareness of vision zero and beginning some behavior change. Um, and then educating the public. Our target audience, obviously drivers, and then our secondary audience uh, were Hispanic drivers with a low SES. And right now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it right over to Gordy so that he can walk us through the creative. Thanks, Linda. Um, if you guys can hear me okay. Yes. <clears throat> One of the things that really has been uh, um, a plus for me with my experience with Dr. Cog and working with Steve years ago on uh, developing the way to go campaign is some what we call in advertising those sticky expressions. And with way to go, it was stop being an SOV. And with vision zero, it's uh, slow speeding. And both of those situations are something that every sort of Denver driver or driver in general can relate to. Everybody's driven a car by themselves and everybody has 
uh, ventured a few miles over the speed limit when it doesn't really feel that um, impactful. And um, the benefit of all this is all these are easily fixable um, by the, the operator of the vehicle themselves. So that was one of our main connecting points um, to really educate people on this new slow speeding term and what it meant and really solidifying all the marketing to come away with the deadliest kind of speeding doesn't look like speeding at all. So when we jumped into creative, we wanted to use um, the brand fonts and brand colors for, uh, for Dr. Cog and Vision Zero. Um, something that was simple and obviously not a lot of words being that it's a billboard. Um, we did billboards, we did bus backs, and I know Linda will um, get into the, the media spend um, and where the money went. And, um, but this is one of the examples of uh, the simple billboards of the deadliest speeds don't feel like speeding at all. Uh, we came up with the URL slowspeedingkills.com, which led people to a, a quick site with more facts and information and uh, uh, the ability to sign up on the pledge. Couple more billboards, um, life ends faster after 40 miles per hour. Um, I'm not gonna entertain you guys with my um, Spanish, but eight out of 10 speeding deaths happen on roads like this one. And this obviously is for placement as you can see. And then next we went out and actually took some of the um, uh, things that people are very familiar with when driving. One of these is the little kid sign that um, most people are familiar with it saying, um, drive like your kids live here. Um, so we changed the message to put it on the campaign, drive slower, they'll live longer. And then again, it has the URL as well. And lastly, in addition to some social media, um, we also uh, had this uh, super fun idea of changing um, your speed is good um, to your speed can kill. If you go, I think it was uh, 41 or 42. Um, and this was placed in uh, Louisville and uh, was, you know, again, another way to extend the campaign out into an experiential um, method that drivers could actually interact with and see slow speeding in the flesh. And can we thank Madam Chair and Mayor Stolzman, um, we really appreciated your stepping up to um, get this up. Thank you. And then lastly, this is just the, uh, the homepage above the fold that we created for the um, uh, slowspeedingkills.com. And Linda, I'm gonna let you speak to this. <laughs> uh, Gordy should really be speaking to it. So we were thrilled because we did submit this to the 50, which is part of the Denver Ad Club's annual award show. And um, we're happy to, to say that Dr. Cog won uh, one of the judges selections, uh, which, is, which means it was really in the top five out of the 50 that they selected. Um, and uh, Steve and his team were able to take the press release and push it out via social. But, uh, just thrilled that it was recognized uh, the way it, it, it was. Anything to add to that, Gordy? No, I think that's it. Okay, great, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about media strategy and the plan. Um, our media partner, uh, Tekent, um, helped drive the media strategy and there were a couple of different components. One was the earned media and uh, that was done with our PR uh, person and then working very closely with with Charmaine at Dr. Cog, and that was the earned media. And we've got a couple little spots to play on that if we have time. And then the second was the paid media and the paid media was comprised of what Gordy just mentioned. We did uh, bus backs, billboards, the experiential that you just saw. And then we did some streaming audio and then a very heavy push into social. These are the, this is the geographic area that we were targeting through the media. Uh, the media ran August through October of 21, and the media spend was about $117,000. On the bus tails, here's just some of those examples that Gordy showed before. They were able to run for about four weeks uh, throughout the Denver metro area. 
And then uh, billboards uh, were able to run throughout the Denver metro area as well. And you can kind of see here um, what those billboards look like as we were able to take some shots from the roads themselves. Streaming audio, um, I'll go ahead and just play this real quick. It's only 30 seconds, but we purchased streaming on Spotify and um, ran a 30 second spot. I'm guilty. Guilty. I'm guilty. I was doing 28 and a 20. I drove 39 and a 30. 27 and a 20. I slammed on the brake. She came out of nowhere. My heart was beating out of my chest. Turns out I am a slow speeder. I mean, we all do it, right? Barely over, but so close to a tragedy. The most dangerous speeding doesn't look like speeding. In fact, 87% of speeding deaths happen off highways. Visit slowspeedingkills.com today. And of course, this was targeting drivers who um, listen to Spotify in their car. I will tell you there was an opportunity to do a banner on Spotify, but we didn't do that because that's not safe driving habits. Um, social media was a big push and uh, Spanish language and English. And uh, we were targeting here adults 18 to 34, um, lower to mid scale household income. And you can see some of the stats here. Our total impressions were well over 2 million with an added value of 116,000 plus. Uh, the social media ran a little bit longer than we were able to do with the bus boards and things like that. Uh, we ran that from August 23rd to October 31st, and it was heavily on the awareness end of it, even though we were trying to drive people to slowspeedingkills.com. Um, as a recap, uh, total impressions delivered, 33 million, um, and we saw 1,100 landing page visits. Again, this was heavily an awareness campaign. Uh, trying to educate and begin to change that behavior. On public relations, um, the general strategy was really focused on driving it, the experiential, which you saw the kid signs and the radar sign, and then the media um, outreach targeting through the larger outlets. And Charmaine, who is on the Dr. Cog team, helped with this along with um, our PR person. And then we leaned heavily on organic social and the relationships that Dr. Cog members have. Um, and you can see Louisville and Arapahoe County there as just a couple of the cities. Uh, this we have already covered. And then I did wanna play this um, if we can, and um, cause it was great earned media from Kyle Clark. Of Nine News. Did I tell you I bought our car from Carvana? Yeah, I'm sorry. It was so easy. I found the perfect car. Under budget, too. And I get seven days to love it or my money back. I love it. I thought online meant no one to help me. But Susan from Carvana had all the answers. She didn't try to upsell me. Not once. Because they're not salespeople. <laughs> what do you guess who just checked in on me? Um, Susan from Carvana. <laughs> we'll drive you happy at Carvana. It's a sign people in Louisville are sick of spears. The city's transportation department has measured the short and long-term impact of these slowdown signs like the new one on South Boulder Road. This is pretty blunt. Your speed can kill. The mayor told us the danger in this spot is often people just going a bit over the limit. And in that area, people do tend to because there is a hill and, and you know, people get comfortable. So they start to go 45. I think sometimes what people think is, oh, I'm just going five over, you know, that's not a problem. But five over can put you up to a speed where you can actually take someone else's life. Mayor Ashley Stolzman says the city's transportation department found that the largest speed reduction happens right after those flashing signs go in, but they have seen a smaller reduction that lasts in the long term. Okay, let's go ahead and stop that. I apologize for those commercials. I thought I had that teed up properly. And that is pretty much our presentation. Um, I think we did okay at 15 minutes. I hope we did. And Mayor Stolzman, thank you again uh, for your help in getting that speed, speed sign up. Thank you for helping us with Vision Zero. This is really important to the board and it's great. Um, it, it's, it's great to see it come into action and make a difference in helping save people's lives. Are there any questions from board members? All right, seeing none, that takes us to our committee reports tonight. 
Um, and so we'll start with the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Maurer. Um, thank you, Chair. And hopefully I can read this um, without my internet not getting interrupted. And if, if I do get interrupted, I did phone a friend <laughs> and Doug Rex will fill in for me. So um, Stack met last Friday, February 11th, and CDOT made a presentation, Transportation Funding 101. And it was an overview of how the state and federal transportation funding works. And I found it very helpful with not only learning the acronyms, but what and how each funding source is allocated. Um, and I'll add that link into the chat, or um, if Melinda has access, she can send to send it out as well. Um, and then CDOT gave an update on the 10 year plan development with anticipated planning revenues and fiscal constraints. And then Michael King from CDOT also provided an overview of state and federal electric vehicle program they have as well as grant opportunities. And if you're interested in learning more, um, right now they don't have it on the uh, website, the, pack, the stack packet for February, because that's where it is. But you can either contact me or also give that, I'll give that information to Melinda. And that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Mauer. Next, we have a report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Starker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the uh, full caucus met on February 2nd in a virtual meeting. We had a, a good legislative update with CML with uh, Megan Dollar and Megan McKillop going through some of the legislation that's coming uh, through the state house. We had a report on from our nominating committee and uh, announced officers for the coming year. We had a review of our activities over the last year. And uh, we looked at the uh, committee achievements and assignments for the coming year. And then we talked about our principles, had a discussion on our principles and the priorities for the uh, 2022 calendar. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Starker. That takes us to a report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Director Baker. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Greetings from Washington, DC. I'm flying back tomorrow. Um, Matt will meet on March 4th, 2022 at Dr. Cog. Thank you for um, to direct, uh, Executive Director uh, Doug Rex for allowing us to do that. In the meantime, we have a survey going out from Dimension Strategies to prepare for that meeting on uh, the 4th. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. Um, that takes us to Director Sanchez Warren with a report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Thank you so much. Uh, we had uh, Jared Hughes, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for the governor come and talk with us about the modernization of the older Colorado. And Zach, this is a really important bill, the most important bill for area agencies on aging in, in Colorado. Um, the good news is, is they didn't change a lot of regulations affecting area agencies on aging, but added to the, the, the support of aging in the state of Colorado. Um, it, modifies the structure of the Colorado Commission on Aging, giving more, uh, I think, authority and autonomy, which is good, uh, establishes a technical advisory committee to really help us implement some of the really good ideas that have come out of the Colorado Commission on Aging, as well as the Strategic Planning Group on Aging, um, and then uh, puts into statute the uh, Lifelong Colorado, which is an initiative to prepare um, Colorado for the aging of its population. Remember, Colorado is the second fastest aging state in the nation. And we have a whole lot of older adults coming down, coming down the pike. And we really need to think about how to best serve those folks and help them, us, it's us guys, uh, live and age as well as we can in the future. So uh, that was, we were really privileged to have him there. Um, I want to also take time uh, to say thank you so much to you, Chair Ashley Stolzman, for your support of the Area Agency on Aging. You, um, I don't know if you'll remember this, but we were in high noon and a lot of my staff was in high noon and you took the opportunity to 
um, talk with them, acknowledge their work. That was so valuable to them. They didn't even know you knew they existed. And, um, and you were able to reference some of the work that they were doing specifically by program. And they were so touched by that. I wanna thank you for your leadership um, and your support. Thank you, Director Sanchez Warren. And that takes us to a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we met on Friday, February 4th, and there was a couple of agenda items of notes. Um, we, uh, we had a presentation from staff on the ozone SIP emissions inventories. Um, we're preparing for the next SIP, SIP call, and um, uh, this was kind of a 101 just to get us, get, get us going in the right direction. Uh, legislative update two, um, the RAC doesn't typically take positions on bills, but it decided to take one on um, House Bill 1026 uh, to, to support the bill. And, and just, to ref, just to remind everybody that that was the uh, alternative transportation options uh, tax credit. And it was, uh, it was a bill we took a position of support with amendments at the last meeting. Madam Chair, that's it. Thank you. Next, we have a report from E470 Authority from Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, uh, E470 has uh, an executive director who is retiring after uh, about six years on the board and 38 years of service in the transportation industry. So Tim Sullivan will be leaving at the end of um, March and a new executive director was selected. His name is Bo Memory and he will be, um, as I mentioned, coming in um, at the end of March. The board also approved a um, amendment to the TSA, the Toll Services Agreement for HTPE, and then a roadway maintenance agreement uh, through a CMGC process. They also received, um, the board also received a Q4 report for finance and operations. Uh, the meeting was, I forgot to mention, uh, last Thursday. Next meeting is next month. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Next, we have a report from CDOT, Director White. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a couple quick notes tonight. I'm happy to announce that Jessica Micklebust has been selected as the new Regional Transportation Director for CDOT's Region 1, which encompasses much of the Dr. Cog region. I think that's probably a familiar name to many folks as she's been with CDOT for a few years now and has uh, been in various roles within the region, but I look forward to introducing her to the board and I'm sure you all have a chance to interact with her in the coming years. Uh, the other quick note I'll make is we announced on February 11th, uh, the recipients of a, a small grant program, um, very much in keeping with a lot of the discussion tonight, but their Transportation Demand Management Grants, or TDM. We had about $492,000 made available, and I'll just highlight uh, a, one of the grants that was uh, given to a community within the Dr. Cog region to the city of Castle Pines received a $47,000 grant uh, to evaluate outreach and plan to identify strategies to connect Castle Pines commuters to existing RTD services and specifically uh, park and rides and transit hubs. So glad to see uh, that award. There was also one for commuting solutions uh, and a expansion of the Colorado car share program to Louisville and Lafayette. Uh, so with that, I think that's all I have for tonight. Please, everyone, uh, drive safe tomorrow if, if you're heading out, uh, given the snow we have in the region. Thanks. Thank you, Director White. Next, we have a report on fast tracks from um, Director Van Meter. Chair, nothing additional to report. I thought that might be the case, but I just wanted to give you the chance. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. So, and that um, next in our packet are our informational items. And so you'll find in attachment N and attachment O, two really useful briefings to look through. There's the Transportation Improvement Program Administrative Modifications, and there's the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, and so you'll wanna look through those. Um, we'll continue to talk about those types of things throughout the year. And if you have questions on those informational briefings, please do contact the staff members listed on those briefings. Our next meeting is March. 16th, and that takes us to other matters by members. Director Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, before we adjourn, I would like the Board of Dr. Cog, uh, and in our minutes, to make note of the passing uh, this week of one of the giant pillars of our community, and that is Joe Blake, 
I know most of us have probably seen the news that Joe passed away yesterday uh, of Pank of 86. Um, those of us who have known him uh, know what a remarkable gentleman he was, a genuinely nice and kind conversation with Joe that didn't make me feel like I was the most important thing in his mind at that moment. Um, a, a native of Denver, East High School, uh, Dartmouth, uh, unfortunately had to go back East, but then he came back to see you and called uh, FBI agent, uh, U.S. Senate aide in the 1960s. Uh, for most of his career, with uh, he was with Mission Viejo as they developed the Highlands Ranch in the uh, 80s and uh, then went on to lead the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce uh, for, I believe, about 10 years before then, uh, becoming the very first chancellor of the Colorado State University system, um, really reviving, uh, pulling together all the different campuses um, under the, his chancellorship. It was my, my honor to know him. And uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, uh, the board in our minutes make note of his passing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Flynn. And we will make sure that's in the minutes. That's fantastic. Um, are there any other members that would like to make comments? Thank you, Rich. There, Rich has added some um, in the chat. Any other matters by members this evening? Um, and Executive Director X, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we can all look forward to October 1st when we can return the favor to you on the birthday wishes. Is that right? <laughs> we'll all mark it down in our calendars no, October 1st. That, That'll be the well, day. Well, October, it, you can, but it's not October 1st, September 20th. September 20th. All right. I remember. I don't know that. how that's not already on everybody's calendar. We'll, we'll mark it down. We'll remember the favor and we'll mark down September 20th for you. Very good. Thank you very much. Executive Director Rex. Any other matters by members? Thank you, everyone. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.